Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. And uh, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, welcome. Uh, I, I hope that tonight uh, is a good experience for you. And maybe you'll join us every Wednesday night for these Bible studies. We also have a Sunday church service that's at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and uh, I invite you to, to join us uh, in that fellowship also. Uh, that's, uh, those programs are hosted by me on this channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, I also have with me Brother Cripps, and uh, he has his own YouTube channel. So, Brother, will you introduce yourself and let everybody know what you're doing on your YouTube channel? Sure, sure. Thank you, Brother Luke. My name is Jason Cripps. My friends call me Cripps, but you can call me Jason, whatever you like. And my uh, part of a channel called True Story Live. And we come on Tuesday, uh, Sunday night at 9. And we also do some shows during the week sometimes, but it's, they're not always uh, planned ahead. Uh, do some testimonies and things like that. And um, I'm uh, glad to be a part of the Wednesday night broadcast for Church of the Turn of the Secure. And um, it's just been a blessing to be part of this uh, Roman study for sure. And I'm, I'm glad to be here. And I hope that uh, Renee's able to make it. But if not, uh, when Brother Luke and I have just been on here by ourselves, we just had a, a blessed time either way. So, um, gosh, I, I, I'm just pleased either way it goes. So, thanks. All right. Thank you, Brother. I, uh, you know, of course, we're, I was going to mention Renee, and she's uh, normally uh, with us every Wednesday night. And I, I think we're, She's going to be with us tonight. I just haven't heard from her, so I don't have anything to tell you, uh, you know, if she's coming for sure or at what time she'll join us. But uh, one way or the other, we're going to continue on anyway and uh, study Romans chapter 7. And uh, I don't know how far we'll get. We might be get through the whole thing, but as, as Brother Hendricks in the chat room already made a comment that uh, this chapter is, is a, a great chapter. And uh, sure you, is. you can say that about all the chapters in Romans and Really, I don't know. Yeah. Probably safe to say that about every chapter of the Paul's writings. Uh, and uh, uh, all right, brother, if there's uh, nothing else to say in terms of introductions, let's get into the scriptures themselves. Um, let me see. I, I, you know, my policy is I, I'm a KJV firstist. Yes. Uh, and I was a KJV onlyist for 25 years. Mm -hmm. But uh, I still use the KJV as the scripture. I rely on it for the truth. I test all other translations uh, by the KJV. But sometimes I find that uh, particularly the amplified translation, is, it can be helpful to me. So I will also be referring to that. But I'll read it first in the KJV, uh, verse 1, chapter 7. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. What, it, what stands out to you that immediately in that uh, verse, brother? He's talking about the law. <laughs> I mean, he, that's the first thing he's bringing up is the law. Yeah. And uh, also, there's, there's two things that I think are, are really interesting. Okay. Uh, well, three. He is talking about the law. But when he says brethren... Mm -hmm. You know that almost everybody, uh, it, when if they're a Christian and they're reading the Bible and they see the word brethren, they automatically assume that it's talking about a Christian believer, right? Yeah. And it very well may be, but it doesn't always mean that because uh, Paul sometimes talks to his Jewish uh, brethren. They're not, there may not be believers in Jesus, but he can call them brethren in the sense that they're brethren and fellow Jews, fellow oh, absolutely. Israelites. Yeah. So um, what is it going to be in this case? I don't know. As, as we continue through the chapter, maybe we'll get a better idea of, of what uh, he means by brethren there. Yes, but sir. the other thing that stands out to me in this verse is what's at the end of the verse? Uh, the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. A Question mark. mark. Question, Question mark. mark. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Gosh. I really, Woo! I challenge everybody to uh, go through the Bible and see how many writers use question marks the way that, that Paul does. 
And uh, you know, this goes back to our, our first or second study when we were, we were talking about the uh, Paul's use um, an oratorical technique called prosopopoeia. Prosopopoeia. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when a person sees the word, uh, they, you try to figure out how am I supposed to pronounce that, and then you. Yeah, I struggled with it when you in the very first series I did on that subject. You hear me pronouncing it, and I'm getting a I'm changing it every time I say it. I'm saying it a little differently, and and I, I looked it up phonetically and tried to figure out how to, um, uh, you know, how to a way so I could get it right all the time. And I I thought there's a a dish and I got it at Mexican restaurants called sopapilla, and it's a it's a little fried bread and um, with sugar on it. Yeah, yeah, that's, so that's why I did that. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, that's ex you got it. You caught it, Brother Luke. It was a <laughs> so, thinly veiled uh, reference to a Mexican dessert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who who knew that Paul enjoyed Mexican food? I did not, but I like him even more now. <laughs> <laughs> little honey, little powdered sugar, delicious. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, for those people who... Uh, did not see the first uh, uh, Bible study on the book of Romans in this series. Uh, first of all, I, if you haven't seen the whole series, we're starting chapter seven now, but we obviously we completed the first six chapters, including the first uh, the first night, I think it was either purely or mostly an introduction to the book. Uh, but in the first couple of uh, studies on this, uh, we did talk quite a bit about this idea of prosopopoeia, and could it be so that Paul is using this oratory technique? And uh, after studying it and giving a lot of thought, I'm convinced that he does use it. And it's basically uh, presenting the opponent's viewpoint and then giving your answer to it. In other words, you're trying to represent your opponent that's not there, so you give their point of view, and then you give your answer. So kind of like you're having a debate with a person, but they're not present. So you're you're going to you're going to say what they they would say if they were there. Uh, and I think his use use of questions is uh, very uh, related to this, in that he's um, by asking questions, uh, he's one he's trying to make us think. <laughs> That's, <laughs> what a what a uh, what a great idea when it comes to studying the scriptures, <laughs> yeah. uh, and and then it's provocative to communicate with someone and ask them a question. You, you know, you're asking them to think about something. Think about this. What is it? What do you say about that? Question mark. And uh, also, um, he's using the technique of questions to um, give the. Uh, the point of view of, of the accusers who say Paul is teaching people they have a license to sin. And, and so he says something like, uh, shall we sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. I mean, question mark, God forbid. So he, he, he's using this technique of question marks very, very expertly. And here we see it again uh, in the beginning of chapter seven. Okay. So that's uh, kind of a, the background of the question um, of the verse. Now let's talk about the verse itself. Um, know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Now see, I think, and by the way, that's in parentheses in the KJV. Now I don't know if the KJV translators actually put the parentheses there uh, or if the parentheses there was in the Greek as they got it. Right, uh, uh, or if it's a publisher, right, that that is put the parentheses there. But uh, so I'm not really sure what the point. I, I, I can, I guess, I can understand if we were not talking about the Bible, we're just reading something, and we we'd understand why this is in parentheses because uh, he's kind of like answering himself or or, or or clarifying. Know ye not, brethren, and then he's saying. When I say brethren, I, I'm saying to talking to you as brethren because you're the people who know the law. Right. Yeah, right. That's why. That's why I think the use of brethren here. Sure. I agree. The, the, either the Jewish believers or the, even the Jewish non-believers, because they could be called brethren in the respect that they're fellow Jews, right? Yeah. How that the law hath dominion over a man, 
as long as he liveth. Okay, tell me what your thoughts are on, on that verse. Uh, well, he's ending with a question, so I wouldn't be able to determine uh, what he's saying quite yet, because if you just look at it, if, if it was a period, it would seem like he's saying, it, it, it would go against what he said so far in the rest of the book of Romans. It's saying that you're under the law as long as you live. So the, the question mark makes me uh, feel like I have to read the next verses to determine what he means by it. Does that make any sense? Yeah. yeah. I, I, mean, I don't think it's a standalone verse. I think you need more context. Yeah. Yeah, that's very, very, very good point. Uh, really, uh, it does. Uh, I didn't even consider that, uh, but it's... Uh, it certainly is a fact that he's uh, basically his entire um, ministry is based on and in, in saying, "Hey, uh, don't don't obsess over the law anymore. Right. Right. It has its purpose. It has its purpose, but the purpose has nothing to do with our salvation except for to show us our need for Christ. Right. So stop obsessing over the law. He's diminishing the law in low ways, but now he's saying, until you die, it has dominion over you." Right. Uh, but maybe it's because he's talking to the Jewish believers who think that they're under the law. Yes. Uh, because they are. He, he also tells us if you put yourself under the law, then you are, right? Yes. But he also says if you do that, you're putting yourself under a curse, aren't you? Yeah. Cursed is the man who puts himself under the law. Yes. Yeah. And that's true. Think about the people that, um, that live their lives under the law. Think about how um, difficult it is for them to even survive in this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they're so concerned about everything. Oh, we can't do this. We can't do that. Oh, and, and they want to point the fingers at other people, too. They spend so much time doing that. Mm -hmm. It seems like they could be focusing on themselves and things that they should be dealing with in their own lives rather than point the finger at other people. But, yeah. you know. Uh, let's pause and say hi to the people in the chat room here. We, we got Brother Hendricks. Uh, Sister Stacy Cook. By the way, uh, this Friday, that's the day after tomorrow, I have a, a Friday night interview scheduled with uh, Sister Stacy Cook. So, hi. Uh, we got a comment from True Story Live. I wonder who that is. Obaya, uh, Owusu. Uh, uh, hi, everybody. He says, okay. Hi, everybody. Yeah. And uh, Zeph. Uh, that's, uh, I don't know what that is, Jeff, but hey, if, if you're here for the first time, uh, I know I want to welcome you, and I ask all the moderators in the chat room, make sure you welcome those people here for the first time. But if you do notice that someone is coming in here, and uh, you should be able to have discernment now. As a moderator, if you've been doing it very long, uh, you should be immediately be able to recognize if someone is coming in with the purpose of just trying to stir up trouble. If that's the case, we don't tolerate it. Just like if, let's say that all of us in the chat room and Brother Pips and I, that we're all in a church building under the same roof, having a Bible study, and then someone comes in through our front door that we don't know, and they immediately start disrupting things and trying to change the subject and, and, and argue against our doctrine. What would we do? Yeah. It's not the place for, for that. We're doing a Bible study. So if someone comes, you know, if they want to talk about doctrine sometime, hey, go to uh, Talk and Doctrine and get on the program with Brother Matthias, and he loves to do that. That's a good, that's the proper place for it. But yeah, this Bible study is not. Right. So, uh, so the way I would, uh, let me interject one thing. So the way you would handle it first is if a person comes in in that situation, the first time you would ask them nicely to, to please not disrupt the service. And if they obeyed, then there would be no reason to do it, take a, another step. But if you've done that and they continue to do it, then you'd have to, to go to the next level. Yeah, exactly. Okay, we got Dan A. Man. Hey, Dan A. Man, are you still jumping for joy, brother? You told me just a couple of weeks ago you came to the realization that you are you have the guarantee of eternal life from Jesus Christ. So you, I wonder if you're still jumping for joy. Uh, and Gen V, hi. And Gen V, yeah. Anna, uh, let me see. Matthias is here, brother. Where is he? I don't see his comment. Yeah, he, uh, he made yeah. a comment. He said hello, everyone. It's up. It's up. Uh, up a little bit. It's been fairly recent. Yeah. Talking doctrines in the yeah. house. Gen V likes how we're already how we're uh, addressing the scriptures, even showing the importance of the uh, question marks and the punk, the parentheses, all these things. Mm, hello, yes, brother, sir. Ryan Jordan's here with us. Hi. 
Okay, all right. Let's get back now to the, to the scriptures here. Now, I'm going to, we read it and talked about it in the KJV. Let's look at this also in the Amplified. Uh, now, when I use the Amplified, what it's really doing is it's like having another person in our study with us, brother. It's like, it's, it's Brother Cripps, Brother Luke, Brother Amplified. <laughs> and now it Amplified's turn to explain the verse to us. And that's what the Amplified does. It amplifies or it's expounding on the verse uh, as, as you read it. So it says, 7 verse 1, Or do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction to rule over a person as long as he lives. Oh, okay. Okay. You see the difference in the, um, the, the end of that where it says, for the law has jurisdiction to rule over a person as long as he lives. Uh, so here it says in KJV, it says, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Now, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, pretty educated I, yeah. I, i'm college educated you know i'm yeah. 68 years old uh, i i have a pretty good vocabulary but sometimes this, this word dominion i did not uh relate it in that way and, and but i think it makes perfect sense to me that the law has jurisdiction to rule over a person as long as he lives it makes me more it's more clear to me the intention of that verse if if their amplification is correct here okay uh Okay, so it's it's not that the the believer is uh, under the law or, or or under the dominion, but the law itself, its purpose and what the wall the law wants to do or the law is attempting to do, the purpose of the law is to have jurisdiction over you. Of course, if it has jurisdiction of a, over us and we can't follow it perfectly, we all fail. <laughs> no. Yeah, so we're all aren't we all doomed to failure when it comes to law? Yes. All right. Uh, okay. Now, well, going otherwise, to... otherwise there wouldn't have been a need for a savior. Yeah. If we weren't doomed to begin with, then Jesus would have had, wouldn't have had any need to come. Yeah. If we could have done it by by the blood of bulls and goats, mm -hmm. and that and that covered it, then we're good. Yeah. You know, we've we've talked a lot about, particularly with Matthias, and, and uh, they, uh, we we try to clarify this: what does it mean to believe, and and uh, analyzing that as much as we can. Uh, and uh, I'm under the opinion that be believing is you come to a realization at, at, a, at a moment something becomes you realize it. It's like an epiphany, or you've seen the light, and you believe it you know it just it's something you ha that happens to you god does not make you believe god does not prohibit you from believing that's the that's the doctrine of calvinism yes if god makes you believe or god won't let you believe it's all god but no but i also believe that a person cannot uh, make themselves believe what they do is they come to a realization that something's true and and, and now they're now they believe yeah um so i would say that um um, if, let me see, um, I forgot why I was, why I was saying that about, uh, um, uh, the law. <laughs> All right. You were oh, reading yeah. that, you were reading the Amplified. Uh, yeah, I was reading the Amplified, but I was, I was talking about, um, I know I had a point, I'll think of it in a minute. Let's, let's, let's just move, move forward and I'll probably think of it later. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Verse 2, KJV, for the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Okay, brother. Yeah. Did you, did you think he was going to be talking talk about marriage and divorce and the death of a spouse? I, I didn't know that that's where he was going to go with this, but. No. I mean, I knew it because I read it before, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it just seems like a strange thing to, to bring up all of a sudden, but he's going to make a point. So he, tell me, tell he, me what, what, what do you think of that so far? We don't have the whole context. Let's pretend for a moment you haven't read the whole chapter before. What do you think? Yeah. If you're reading this. How would you react if all of a sudden he's telling you that you're under dominion of the law as long as you live, and then he goes into this about I'm, being married? 
if I hadn't read the rest of Romans every week with you, then I would be a little nervous that he's changing his tact a little bit. That's Renee, I bet. Yeah, this is Sister Renee. Let me ask her. Okay. Hi, Sister. You're on speaker. And everybody, everybody can hear you. Okay. We, we're, we're going to... Okay. I'm so sorry. T ten minutes and counting. Bye. Bye. Okay. So set your uh, set your uh, time keep time pieces. Duly in, noted. In ten minutes at seven thirty seven forty four, Sister <laughs> Renee will be with us if yeah. all goes according to plan. Yeah. So uh, the first the first scripture the first or the first verse he's got the question mark. So as I said that that kind of makes me want to have more context because I'm not sure where he's going yet. And then he comes out the door with this. It's like it seems like he's talking about the law again, and talking about you're bound to your husband as long as you know. After what he said in the first one, the, the law hath dominion over a man as long as you liveth. Then he's saying, "Oh well, for the woman also, which hath a husband, is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband." I mean, that part's pretty straightforward, and people have used this verse many times to. Uh, rail against people going through a divorce, in fact. So, uh, and certainly any verse you take out of context, you can have it say whatever you want, as you know very well. Mm -hmm. So, but for me, fortunately, for me, I've learned to not just take one verse and just uh, listen to what someone says. Um, if I hear a verse that doesn't seem to make sense or doesn't add up to other things being said by Paul in other uh, books and also in the book of Romans, then you have to have more context. So, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, but it just does seem like, whoa, man, where is he it going? Seems odd. Yeah. Is, particularly everything else we've read before this. And now why is he talking about a, a husband and wife's marriage and a death? Okay. Uh, let's look at this in the Amplified. For the married woman, as an example. Okay. So they're saying as an example, because that's what he's doing here. He's okay. trying to give us a picture illustration to make his point. So the Amplified says, hey, uh, Paul is saying this little story here to give you an example of something. Okay? Right. For the married woman, as an example, is bound and remains bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released and exempt from the law concerning her husband. Wow. Hey. Okay. I, right. see, I see a shadow of what's coming, and I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, someone uh, who was it that said they, they love the book of Romans and they say, oh, take that back. I love the whole Bible. Yeah, but it is interesting to me how uh, the various books and, and various authors, you know, God's the author, but, but he, uh, he allows the, the writer. Uh, we say that God uses the writer like we use a pen. Yeah, but on the other hand, the writer somehow retains some kind of uh, contribution to it, in that he's um, his personality, his style, and his yeah. his intellect and, and everything can can come into it in terms of how he structures sentences and mm. and uh, all, all this. Like Paul is, I I think it's probably universally accepted that Paul is the most scholarly of any any of the Bible writers. Uh, yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe in the Old Testament, there's somebody that that could be on his level, but in the New Testament, I'm certain nobody can, is uh, on quite on Paul's level. Yeah. What do you think of Luke? Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I would say that Luke is probably up there with Paul. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because yeah. Luke is renowned as a historian. Right. And he's also a physician. He's obviously very educated. Yes, sir. That's the so, first thing that popped. I'm not arguing with you for sure. I'm just saying Luke, I think, would be. Uh, yeah, it's okay to argue with me, too, because you know we, I mean. when we when we argue, we do, we do it with respect and love. It's just, oh, of course. It's not course. with any anger or hostility. It's argument like an attorney says, let me present my argument. And I disagree with you. And this is how this is why. Praise God. So, OK, let's go to the next verse. This is verse three. OK. Um, well, let me read verse two and three together because they kind of, they, they're meant to be go together. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth, 
But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband is dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though so she be married to another man. Um, I think that there's two uh, kind of legal uh, are two um, points that are made in, in that verse there. Let me give you your, your thoughts first, though. Yeah, yeah. So, again, I'm starting to get a little nervous. <laughs> 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 Pretending that I don't know the rest, of the, the rest of the verses and also based on what I've heard from Paul so far about how he's making the uh, the separation, the difference between the law and grace and the dead, dead, dead law and uh, uh, being alive in the newness of, of uh, Christ. Uh, and what that means for the believer, then it's uh, it's 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 a little confusing. But you mentioned uh, lawyers. That's what he's sounding like a little bit here to me. It's it's almost like he's talking. I I, I can picture him talking to a group of lawyers in this, using the law as a way to get in underneath their defenses uh, to make a, a larger point. Does that make any sense? Yeah. 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 Uh, so. Uh, I'm going to read that verse 3 in the Amplified now. Okay. Accordingly, so you see it says accordingly, and then in the KJV it says, so then if. Um, but so, so Paul does this all the time. He'll say something and that said in basically, uh, therefore, <laughs> you know, therefore, oh, here it is. I come up in verse, verse 4. He says, wherefore. And then uh, Amplified it says, therefore, but, but this word therefore uh, is used an awful lot by Paul because he'll, he's, he's laying a foundation and then he'll give you his conclusion based upon, he'll take two, three, four, five, ten verses, and then he'll say, and I conclude, or therefore, this is the conclusion you should get. This is what you need to understand. Um, so uh, in the Amplified it says, accordingly, uh, she will be designated as an adulteress if she unites herself to another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law regarding remarriage so that she is not an adulteress if she marries another man. Uh, all right, so I, I think we've got two issues here. One is a totally different study that we could go into and should go into someday and that is the whole subject of marriage and divorce but that's not what really this is about no but it uh, really is uh uh you know that he's saying this because this is a subject that they should all be very familiar with so mm -hmm. he's using marriage and divorce uh in a way that they well let's find something that they can relate to so they can make get my point so yeah says marriage and divorce i can i can paint the picture for him using that yeah uh but then the other thing is uh uh this idea of re remarrying uh or, you know you're an adulteress if you remarry uh while your spouse is alive right but if they if they're dead there's no sin against that it's not right. adultery or nothing's wrong with that right as long as they they're dead mm-hmm so this is the this is the point he's trying to he wants us to understand. Uh, all right, let's take a look at the. Uh, There's a lot of places I could go from there too. If we were doing a, a show on divorce, which we're not. Yeah. <laughs> Only reason yeah. I say that is we just did one Sunday night. I don't know if you got a chance to hear any of it, but we uh, we tackled this topic on. It was uh, the subject was divorce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so you probably actually discussed these very verses. Um, all right, then, uh, let's go to the verse um, 4, okay? Yes, sir. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Okay, brother, use your uh, great uh, linguistic uh, talents 
explain that one to me. It's like always like a little jigsaw puzzle, uh, but I'm looking forward to the amplified for it'll to help me on that one. <laughs> Go ahead. Verse four, right? So wherefore, yeah. Yeah. my brother, you also are become dead to the law. Okay, so here again, he's going back to the same point which he's said many times in Romans. And last week we talked about this a lot, where he does the contrast between uh, being under the law and being under grace, and many, many times. And we talked about. Uh, being dead, you know, being the zombie before we're quickened and we have uh, his spirit in us. And so um, he references the law of the body of Christ, um, that you should be married to another, even to whom he who is raised from the dead. So that's a reference to Christ. We're being married to Christ in this uh, in this verse, in my opinion, um, that we should bring forth uh, fruit unto God. So this is the result of being married to Christ, is bringing forth good fruit. And this is borne out in the rest of his epistles, too, and talking about the fruits of the Spirit and whatnot. Um, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. These are all uh, fruits of the Spirit that we get and are examples for other people to see that we are believers and that we are, we are uh, no longer dead to, uh, I mean, we're not uh, any longer dead in our sin but we're alive in Christ Jesus. It's a good example, and that's what he's referencing here. Mm -hmm. Being okay. married to Christ and not in a gross way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so he's using the law, and he's using marriage, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, either divorce or a um, death of a spouse, and he's trying to make us come to an understanding of something. Mm -hmm. And but here's, here's his conclusion, his therefore, in the Amplified. Okay. Therefore, my fellow believers. Okay. You see, they're taking the step that I wasn't willing to take in verse 1. Uh, in, in that the brethren in verse 1, it very well could mean fellow believers. Yeah. Or it could mean fellow Israelites. Right. Okay. So the Amplified, at this point, they're willing to say that this is fellow believers. Yeah. Therefore my fellow believers, and the Aunt KJV says, my brethren. Um, you too died to the law through the crucified body of Christ. Okay, now see that? Ye, uh, in the KJV says, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is taking it a step further and clarifying it. It's through the crucified body of Christ, through his death, where in the, in the, in the KJV, it doesn't state it as clearly. I can see now, of course, that's what it means. But uh, here it's saying, hey, you died, died the law through the crucified body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead. So... Um, Belong to another, uh, obviously, that's the idea of the remarriage. Okay. Uh, now, you've, you've died to the law, and because, uh, uh, because of, of that, now you're free to remarry, to marry Christ. Uh, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. Mm. Okay. Now, my, not much, uh, it, it's not uh, uh, saying any more. It's, it's, it's just a simple statement. Uh, right. and, and we can't really, uh, I don't want to read into it more than, more than it's there, but it kind of comes out of me, uh, out of the blue, adding this point in here, so that we may bear fruit for God. Yes, so, sir. Is this, is this whole thing, the, the 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 solution to man's dilemma. Oh God, I remember what I was talking about earlier. <laughs> remember when I said I couldn't remember? I do remember. I, I to what I tell you too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me pause here because I can always come back to the verse. But uh, okay, we're talking about um, uh, somehow something you said made me think of the word surrendering. What? Uh, yeah. I mean, oh yeah. You yeah. You talked about our hopeless situation. Yeah. Something like we are we're in a hopeless situation. I think you phrased it a little bit differently, but this is a point that, of understanding that I think is integral or um, really uh, probably I don't want I'm, I 
I don't know if I dare say it's essential that it, you have to have it, but I think it's pretty much the normal thought process that you, a person goes through. They realize that they're in a hopeless situation. Right. They cannot go to heaven or they cannot have eternal life by, through, by their own efforts, by achieving it. Mm. Uh, and, and therefore, they realize that since that's impossible, they, they feel hopeless and hopeless. Uh, and therefore, they surrender. Now, when I say surrender in, in this case, I'm not talking about surrendering over your will to God right. to get saved. Because some people will teach that to get saved, you need to surrender your life to Christ. That's what getting saved is. You're surrendering your life to Christ. But, so, yeah. Hi, sister. Yeah. <laughs> Glad you got, could be here. Uh, let me Works. finish, uh, finish my thought and then get your, your reaction to it. <laughs> She's <laughs> chomping at the bit, brother I'm Luke. Talking ready about, to go. I'm talking about the use of the word surrender and the concept. Now, if, if I was preaching the gospel and said you need to, to get saved, you need to surrender your willpower and your life over to God, turn your life over to God, and um, uh, I think we'd all agree that would be a false doctrine. But if I said you need to surrender in the, in the way that you're giving up trying to gain it on your own, you yeah. give up. I surrender. I cannot gain it on my own. I can't do it. Can't and do therefore, it now I'm just relying on you, Jesus, to give it to me. Amen. That's the correct way. So in that way, we should be surrendering, surrendering our effort. And then after we are saved, what we want to do is surrender our will so that the Holy Spirit can take over our lives and transform us and guide us. But we don't all do that as well. We? Transformed by the daily renewing of our minds. You okay. can't surrender your life to Christ if he doesn't live in you. Yeah, okay. All right, so let me get your feedback Ooh. on that. Because what I did was I went back 10 minutes and remembered something I was trying to say. And I for, I went through a brain, a brain stupor. <laughs> I, since I remembered, I went back. So talk about that if you want. And then we'll get back to the scriptures we're on. Verse 4, uh, 7, verse 4. Don't they call that a senior moment, brother? <laughs> I'm only 35 years old. <laughs> In Christ. <laughs> You're probably yeah. older. You're probably older than that in Christ, but yeah, anyway. actually, yeah, I, yeah, Jason. <laughs> yeah, I'm 30, 32, uh, born again, 32. There you go. Okay, Renee. Uh, uh, I just wanted to say, surrendering your life is just a clever way of adding works. Obviously, okay, yeah. to surrender your will in your life. First of all, how much? And who does that 100% perfectly? What if you flip the guy off that made you mad in traffic? Are you surrendered completely? And you know you're not surrendered completely, so are you really saved? Then it's all about what you did. Speech. It's all about your ability. Stop. It's all about your ability to be willing to live and serve Christ. Okay? Speech. Speaking of meow meow. Yep, there you nah, go. Nah, no. That's for Jason. All right, now no. let me. Okay, so he had to he had to get you with the cat. I promise. I he got me. Just so uh, he knows, he got me. <laughs> so what that is is, uh, what is God's will that all live godly lives, right? So now it's about what you're doing instead of what Christ already did on the cross, and that's how they sneak it in. Because God's will, everyone keep his commandments. And now we're looking at the law, how well we keep the law or abstains from sin, but sin is transgression of the law. So it's all about you and what you do. But the correct surrender was what Luke said. You come helpless. You have surrendered. You've gone. I give up. I give up. I can't save myself. I am guilty under the law. And now I have surrendered any chance that I can contribute or save myself. And I have just put my childlike, because you must be as a child, childlike faith in the death, burial, and resurrection in my Savior for eternal life. I have surrendered to the fact that I can't do it. And I have said, I'm going to rest in what you do. That's the correct surrender. Surrendering your will in your life. You can't even do it if you're not saved. So you got to get saved first. Then you've got something to surrender to. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, it's will worship. Because now you're using your willpower to taste not, touch not, handle not, trying to please God in the flesh, and you can't please God in the flesh. You, you have can't. to have a spirit 
to surrender to. You have Amen. to have God's voice to surrender to. So they're putting the cart before the horse. Oh, how many times do they do that? Uh, all the time. <laughs> yeah, all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, sister. Uh, I'm going to read on. We're, we're on uh, verse uh, four. Uh, I was given my thoughts on verse four. I'm reading it in the Amplified. Uh, we read it in the KJV and studied it that way. So now it says, therefore, my fellow believers, you too died to the law through the crucified body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. Okay, this was the point I was going to make and actually I'll, I will ask about. Is the point, he says, the reason I'm asking you is, it's phrased here, in order that. That's making me think that uh, that's the whole point of getting saved. Uh, is the point of getting saved is so that we can bear fruit? Um, I, I, I don't know. Some people would say, well, the, the point of getting saved is so that we can become a child of God and, and uh, so that we can become, uh, have the, the, uh, the barrier between man and God rem removed and, and have this relationship with God. Uh, uh, but then, of course, we know, and I've said it over and over again, don't you know, Christians, that as a child of God, now you have a job. <laughs> God wants to put you to work. God yeah. has a ministry for you, not to prove you're saved or to, to uh, keep your salvation, but as a privilege and an honor, we get to serve the God Almighty. Uh, so in this in this verse here, I think it's making that point that look, the whole point of all this is so that you can bear fruit, so that you could. And if you're just a Christian and that you got born again, and you're never going to bear any fruit. What a great disappointment because you missed the whole point. Now you're in the army of God. Now you're in God's service. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Tell me your thoughts on that. Renee, you get to go first because I've been having Brother Cripps go first. And we'll take well, the I mean, I, the, it, this is hard because I want to go into the whole story, you know, with, with the law being Hagar and Sarah being grace and you cast out the bond woman because the son of the promise cannot be uh, the son of the promise will not share being an heir with the son of the bondage. So you, you can't bring law into grace. Well, you that's know, that's, that's coming up. We're, we'll be getting into that. So if you die, see, you, you, you're no longer married to the first covenant. You can't be married to the first covenant and be married to Jesus. So you cannot be married to the law because you are divorced. You're dead to the law. You're not even divorced from it. You're dead. That husband is dead. As a matter of fact, you're dead. You died on the cross. So that guy that had to be under the law, which we weren't Israel anyway, but that guy, he's dead. He died Amen. on the cross. So now we're married to Christ. Yes. So you cannot be remarried to the law and stay married to Jesus. Woo. So it says, wherefore, my brethren, you are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Because it says the death in Hebrews, it tells you that a testament can only be canceled when there's the death of the testator. And Jesus is the testator and he died. So that testament is dead that should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Yeah, because you can't bring forth fruit under the law because you can't even please God by the law because that's in the flesh. It tells you that the law is not a faith. Yeah. So you, you can't even produce fruit by well, the law. What about, what about that use of that word should there, sister? Was that important at all? Oh, oh yeah, it should. It doesn't say... If you're married to Christ, you will definitely bring forth fruit unto God. No, it's saying you should be married. You're married to Christ. Therefore, because you're married to him, you should bring forth fruit. And that is God's will that all should walk in newness of life. Yes, newness of life. Yeah, it's, it's, it's his will that all grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord. He wants us all to be in his word and all to uh, grow in Christ. That's what we should be yes. doing. The problem is these preachers are saying that if you don't, it means you're not saved 
or you you know it proves something you know whatever they choose for the day and and it doesn't because you still got flesh to deal with the problem is most people don't realize there is still a battle with the flesh so then they think they're not saved no we're gonna reckon that guy dead and alive to christ so we should bring in you know if you go around telling people you're not saved because you're not producing fruit and therefore it proves you're not saved well then you haven't reminded them that they're married to christ and then because it's the truth that you're in christ and that you should bring forth fruit not, and not be married to the law that helps you bring forth fruit to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, brother, brother Cripps, uh, before we went live, he said, Oh, I wanted to tell you, I went to your channel and looked at some of your oldest videos. And we were talking about that. And, okay. and what, actually one of my oldest videos is entitled the difference between must and should. That's a great one. That's yeah. a great one. I've seen yeah. that. Yeah. It's it's the it's the key that is that everybody needs to get it or else they're they're never going to understand the relationship. You're rightly dividing uh, salvation from service. You got it. You yeah. said it. Yeah, that's, that's the right. best way to use rightly dividing. Thank you, Renee. Yeah. Everybody Correct. should see Luke's video on should versus must. Yeah, that's I agree. A good video. All right, I'm going to read uh, now uh, verse five in the KJV. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Death fruit. (laughs) Okay, you're ready to go, Brother Chris. Tell me. Tell me about it. Yeah, okay. So just like we've talked about in previous weeks about uh, us originally being zombies, we could only follow the things a zombie follows. Uh, we could not produce good fruit unto life. We're, we, we're not capable of it. So he's just bringing that point up again, which which he's done many, many times. For when we were in the flesh, we were the zombies, the motions of sin, the, the, the same motions that a zombie makes, uh, walking around uh, following the things of the flesh, which is the only thing it can follow, mm-hmm. uh, which were by the law. Uh, They worked on our members, which we explained uh, what that means last week, but for those that weren't here, so members is just another word for our our various parts. Um, And Brother Luke and I discussed whether that meant like members of the body or members of the actual physical body or the spiritual body, and we decided that it meant the latter. And uh, bring forth fruit unto death. He's saying the same thing. When you're a zombie, you bring forth fruit of a zombie, which is death. That's what we're headed for without Christ. Mm-hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Sister Renee. Hold on. I was saying hello to my friend from Australia who's here tonight. Nurse, They're nursing a baby kangaroo. I had to say hello to her. Nice. Well, for when we were in the flesh. I love that. I love how he explains in the flesh because so many preachers take that walking in the flesh as if you're sinning he's not saying that right Even in the flesh is trying to earn it through performance of the law Woo. and that's what they don't get no. that's why those in the flesh can't please god why would you think being in the flesh is sin would you think sin can please god those that sin can't please god that's not what it says those in the flesh those performing in the flesh works of the law because the law is not a faith it is weak through the flesh yeah. so for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law. Hello, people. Stop saying you got to balance grace out with a little bit of law. You're bringing in the strength of sin to the grace. Grace Ooh. teaches us to forsake all ungodliness. And they should know that if they had grace. Did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So sin brings death. We know that. The wage of sin is death. But the gift of God is uh, eternal life to Christ Jesus. By the way, if you're saved... And you live in a bunch of sin. It is destructive to your physical life. I just yes. want to remind you that it can still destroy you just because you're saved and you're in perfect standing with God for eternity. Temporally and experientially, it will still destroy you. you can have death to your finances, death to your relationships, death to your job. You can have all kinds of death come to you through sin. But here he's talking about literal, physical, eternal death. You know, it brings death to us. Yep. 
Yeah. I'll read it in the Amplified. It says, uh, when we were living in the flesh, that is trapped by sin, the yeah. sinful passions which were awakened by that which the law identifies as sin were at work in our body to bear fruit for death since the willingness to sin led to death and separation from God. Yeah, it's, um, it uh, makes it pretty clear. Uh, the um, And it's talking about here uh, the death. We were at work in a body of our fruit for death since the willingness to sin led to death and separation from God. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's much more I can say about that. That verse, Renee, were you going to say something? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, I thought I heard you talk. Uh, all right, let me go to the next verse. In verse 6, KJV is, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Okay, Renee, I saw, I noticed the word should again there. Renee? Bring it, Renee. Hey, Amen. I tried to turn my thing off so you wouldn't hear the background here and bother you. Let no me... Uh, over here all right but now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held God, how many times do you have to tell you if you're under the law it brings death <laughs> Dad, you're gonna die paul said he didn't even know it until when he saw the law it slew him it yeah him. that we should serve we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the matter so what we're doing here is we're not saying we're going to please God by keeping these rules. This is how we please God. No, we should know we're already in right standing with God. The spirit is in us and he will guide us daily on how we should interact with others. And so we're at peace. We're not trying to obtain righteousness in God's eyes. That's done. Yeah. And so because we're free and at peace, we should serve in newness of Spirit. Like, I don't even think of sin. I'm thinking, did I lie today? Did I steal today? Did I murder today? I'm not thinking like going down the letter of the law. Nope. Being led by the spirit. And the thing is, you have to shut that flesh voice down so that you can hear the spirit because the law wants to, the law is like in the flesh. It's that old tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. It's constantly trying to condemn you. So you have to, you should walk in newness of spirit. And that should include gratitude, peace, and joy, by the way, because yeah. you're free from the death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'll go next, Brother Cripps. You get to go last on this one. But it says, uh, but now we are delivered from the law that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and again i'm saying hallelujah because uh not only uh, are we not preaching and paul is not preaching oh just get saved and then go sin all you want don't worry you don't need to serve you don't need to do anything for god after that you don't need, just just go and live for your yourself and be selfish and and uh paul says god forbid that's what he's doing all the time is saying He's, he's using this prosopopoeia. He'll present a point that, that he's being accused of teaching. And he'll say, God forbid, don't accuse me of that. That's not what we're saying at all. And I've heard Sister Renee say it over and over again. I keep saying it over and over again. We're not saying we don't want you to serve or that you shouldn't be serving or it's not important to serve. We're saying quite the contrary. You, you should serve God after you get saved. In fact, what a great privilege and honor and joy it is. Yes. If you're not doing it, you're the one that's losing out of the, 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 the joy of serving God. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. So it says we, we should serve in newness of spirit. Now, now our spirit is brought to life. We have a joyful living spirit instead of walking around like a dead zombie, the way Brother Cripps likes to illustrate it. I love it. You're not a dead zombie spiritually. Your spirit's alive, and and once it comes alive, uh, you should jump for joy, and from that point forward, remain in joy with this great blessed assurance that we have 
And when people lose that blessed assurance, it's the saddest thing that a person can lose that joy and assurance and that certainty uh, that they're uh, the guarantee of eternal life uh, and all the promises from Jesus. And when people uh, end up um, fearing, and that's just that's so sad when that happens. But uh, the newness of spirit is it's these are the things that happen when your spirit is new, renewed and not in the oldness of the letter. Now, maybe, Cripps, maybe you can tell me, um, I remember Jesus talking about and criticizing the uh, the Pharisees for doing something according to the letter of the law. They know the letter of the law, but they don't know the heart of the law. I think I'm saying it, uh, I'm using somewhat uh, paraphrasing it, but do you or Renee know what Jesus was talking about when it's in the what they're doing is these Pharisees and people I know all meet all the time on YouTube, they're nitpicking. Mm -hmm. they're, they're straining nets, yeah. swallowing camels. They're trying to find the slightest little thing to cause divisions and arguments over and trying to like, find the exact letter of law. Every jot and tittle boy in there and looking for trying to criticize you. And yet they don't understand the big picture is can't you just love each other? That's why Jesus could roll it all up and said, this is what I'm really saying. And all this is just saying, love each other. Yeah. Amen. Crips? Okay. Uh, verse 6, there, there are several things. Now, this is a little bit of a stretch, but there, there's a point to it. Remember, you guys remember that song about um, Peter and John went to pray up in the temple one day? They, they saw... Uh, uh, a man begging at the gates that couldn't walk. And then he was asking for uh, alms. And uh, Peter, uh, uh, Peter said to him. Um, I remember that one. He was yeah, yeah. called beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So he says, uh, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. And the point I want to make here is his reaction. He got up. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. <laughs> walking and leaping and praising God Brother, in the name of the, Jesus I'm not the Christ. I'm first one to jump for joy, am I? That's you what are I not. said about Luke. I said that today. I said the reason Luke's so happy is because he's always looking at Jesus. He's yes. never looking at himself. It's always looking at Jesus. Yes. So this is the way that we should be acting when we realize that once we were dead and could not walk in the newness of life, and now that we are alive, our spirit is quickened from death into life, we walk in the newness of life. We should uh, be, in, that, that should be an example to us of what we're doing. We should be walking and leaping and praising God that once we were dead and now we are alive. So in the verse itself, the first word that stands out to me is the word delivered. Delivered doesn't mean you're kind of left in it a little bit. It doesn't mean that you have to go back and you have to study your sins and make sure and look at every jot and tittle as Renee was referring to, of just looking at everything and saying, oh, did I do this? Did I do this? Did I do this? No, it says we're delivered from the law. And then here's the point, being dead wherein we were held. That's, that's the second word that stands out to me. We're delivered because we had been held before. We were held in our sins and in, in, the, in the law and in death. And then, uh, so the result of that then would be what I was referring to, the walking and leaping, is that we should serve in newness of spirit. Our spirit is renewed. It's no longer dead. And not in the oldness of the letter. So that's the jot and tittle that Brother Luke was referring to, that the, the, the Pharisees would do. They would uh, strain gnats. I like that term. That's what they were doing. And uh, and God wants, wants them to see the big picture, that they are to walk in newness of spirit, newness of life in Christ. They're no longer dead zombie flesh walking around, following the things of the flesh. They don't have to do that. We've been delivered from the law. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, I'll I'll read it. Let me see. I I'll read it in the Amplified real quick. See if there's anything else we gain from it. But but now we have been released from the law and its penalty, having died through Christ mm. to that by which we were held captive, so that we serve God in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter of the law. Yeah. 
beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Died walking. Through. Yeah, Renee, you talked a lot about uh, we died with Christ, and you know, of course, that's Paul's. Uh, Paul made that point. We learned it from Paul, and uh, uh, it's it's something that. Uh, Oh, gosh, uh, so many people we encounter, they if they just understood that, they, that would solve so many problems in the, in the false understandings of the gospel. Um, okay, I'm going to go to the next verse, uh, verse 7. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Uh -oh. Question mark. Question mark. Question mark. Okay, KJV, verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? See, you see, you see, this is prosopopoeia. This is uh, um, this is Paul presenting the argument that uh, the opponents, the false teachers, are accusing him of teaching. He's presenting them like, hey, the, the false teach, hey, Paul's teaching you that uh, that uh, the uh, the law is sin. Just go ahead and sin, and so Paul's addressing this. Just mm -hmm. like Renee and I, we all have to address this all the time because the false teachers are accusing us of being antinomian. Yep. Well, I guess Paul's antinomian. He's against using the law for a saved person uh, to be under it as yep. a requirement for salvation. That if that's that's uh, I'm antinomian. If that's if that's the way what you think, what shall we say then? Question mark. Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Renee? Yeah, I, I love this whole section here, man. I love it. I'm not going to get ahead of myself, but I love it. And I like the question mark now, because now I understand, Prasopopoeia, as you were saying, where he's always putting the uh, enemy of the gospel's arguments out there and then answering them. Yes. Uh, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Like is, is Paul preaching against the law? Like it's bad. God forbid. Nay. And, and he say, and he's showing you the proper use of the law. Do you remember what it said? It is, the law is good. If it's used lawfully, meaning not for salvific purposes. Yeah. So, He's showing you the proper use of the law, and it is to show you your sin. So to be a schoolmaster, bring you a Christ. He's showing you right here. Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin. So what's the strength of sin? The law. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. I didn't even know I had committed these sins against God until the law showed me. That's what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Brother Cripps. All right. So again, we have the question mark at the front, which uh, by the way, brother Luke, it seems like that prosopopoeia thing keeps coming back around from time to time. Does it not? Yeah. 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 So again, he starts with the question. And I love it. When Paul says this, I, I see him as being a little bit fired up. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No, um, we we're. Uh, I've heard Renee this several times. The the law is to shut our mouths. That's what it's for, so that we we can we cannot boast in our own works, and and to make it clear that it's not in our own works. Uh, does it uh, does it remove uh, does it remove the law? No, the law is still there, but we're not under that. We're under grace. Um, so for I had not known lust, that's a good point. So if you go to another country, they have different set of laws and you have to be very careful and it, it'd be good for you if you're going to go to another country to just kind of check into the local uh, wherever you're going and kind of find out what their, what their rules and regulations are because you could accidentally do something and get arrested because you're ignorant of the law. So the, the law is there to show us what God considers sin. And in this, in this uh, verse, he uses lust, for example. He says, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So it's for the purpose of showing us what God would consider sin. 
And fortunately, um, well, unfortunately for us, but fortunately because we have a loving God that sent his son who could be perfect because we can't be perfect. We, we can't follow everything exactly before a righteous God. So he sent his son to do that for us so that we're not under that. We're under grace. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. All right. I'll go to verse eight. You going to do the Amplified? Um, well, it doesn't. No? I'll read it. Okay. okay, I'll read it in the Amplified. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, if it had not been for the law, I would not have recognized sin. For I would not have known, for example, about coveting what belongs to another and would have had no sense of guilt if the law had not repeatedly said, you shall not covet. Amen. Yeah. That's worth it. That's worth reading. Mm -hmm. I was just making the same point, but it's, it's, it's in a little bit different way, you know. On the contrary, I like that. On the contrary, that that's a good phrase. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, verse eight, KJV. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concup concupiscence. I've said this word concupiscence. Say it, please. Say it for me. I, I think it's concup. I can't say it now. Concup. <laughs> concupiscence. Oh, Renee, can you pronounce it? Concupiscence. Concupiscence. Let me see yeah, it. Can't do it either. Wait a minute. Let me see it. Okay. Oh, I got to look at the word. Con I, I've said it before. I know. I, 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 concupiscence. Concupiscence. Con concupiscence. He said it right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. yeah. Finally, right. I did it. You know. Uh, what? Okay. The. the but the commandment wrought in me all manner of compu concupiscence. <laughs> For without the law, sin was dead. Okay. Uh, Renee? <laughs> all right. You yeah. gotta give me a second. I'm looking that word up. There you okay. go. <laughs> uh, let me read it in the Amplified here. Okay. <laughs> but sin... <laughs> Finding an uh -huh, opportunity got it. the commandment to express itself produced in me every kind of coveting and selfish desire. So it's supposed to be defined as coveting. Sexual, sexual right. lust. It's sexually relevant. Okay. Sexual desire and lust. Also, ardent, usually sensuous longing. Okay. Wow. Paul, Paul, of all people. But it, it's not just sexual. It says a sensual longing, like you really desire something. Uh -huh. like you, it's like a, a strong desire for something. It doesn't have to be sexual, but usually the connotation does have a sexual one. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, I'll tell you, again, when Paul, he, he talks about how uh, – he didn't have a need to get married. He wasn't struggling with lust. Right. But if you're if you're someone that struggles with it, you need to get married. You know, right? But it'd be better if you could be like him. Uh, but uh, he doesn't. Uh, is not troubled by that so much. But now it looks like here he's saying, but he he rocked me in all manner of this stuff. Yeah, it's uh, it's I think in the context here because it it can be a, a sensual desire, not just sexual, but like a strong uh. Like, I want this. I want that. I want this. I want yeah. that. I want more. Yeah. The, the, the amplified, the amplified says, produced in me every kind of coveting and coveting. selfish desire. Coveting and selfishness. That's perfect. Yes. Yeah. Good way that sounds coveting. more like Paul, doesn't it? I mean, not, not, not that he's bad, <laughs> but I'm just saying, rather, <laughs> right. than, rather, rather than him being a sexual right. Lover, Right. Well, he was an older man when he said that stuff, too, so it may have passed him a little bit. Yeah. I yeah. wonder how old he was when he wrote this. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Um, Renee, uh, teach, us, right. uh, teach us verse 8, please. Let me get over there. Hold on one second. Good gracious, my mouse. But sin, take an occasion by... Uh, uh, this is important. Sin, how did it take occasion? By the commandment. <laughs> Shame on you, commandments. The sin took occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of con 
Coopersets, is that how you said it? For yes. without the law, I knew I'd said it one time right. At some time. Yep. For without the law, sin was dead. So how did the sin take place in him and stir it up? By the commandment. Yeah. The fact that he was told not to do it stirred up all the things he wasn't supposed to do in him. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I think I've heard you talk about that. You know what? Your teaching sounds a lot like Paul's to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I explained they did a, a, a they did a psychological experiment. It wasn't biblical where they had children and they had a whole yard at a birthday party. They had one little patch of grass they were not allowed to touch. They had the first set of kids and didn't tell them not to get on it. They could get on it all they want. Not yes. one time did a kid step on it. The moment they told them no, every child, when people weren't looking, put their foot on it. Wow, man, what a perfect proof of these scriptures. And I've said, if you get a pile of candy and you see you can have all this candy, but this kind you can't have, they're going to do everything they can to get their hands on it. Yep. Yeah. That's the law. That's the yeah. law. That sounds like something that happened in the garden to me. Mm -hmm. You can't have that one. That's the one I want. Yep. <laughs> I find it interesting that they say that that tree was in the midst of the garden, almost like it was their focus. Yeah. That tree was in the midst. It was in the middle. It was the focus of all their, you know, attention. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Brother Cripps, tell us about it. Yeah, so all I was going to do is use a similar example, but Renee uh, did that well enough. But um, I had two, uh, as most of us did, two sets of grandparents. And when I went to one grand grandparent's house, they had no issue with me going into the cookie jar and getting a cookie from time to time. No issue whatsoever. The other grandparent was very restrictive about caloric intake, and they made it a point to restrict me from uh, getting cookies. So the first time I didn't know the rules and I went in there and walked into the kitchen, went in the cookie jar and grabbed myself a cookie, got myself in a little bit of trouble because the rules were different from one grandparent to another, where in one, I had the liberty to take a cookie anytime I want. And the other one restricted my cookie intake. So I didn't know that there was a problem until it was pointed out to me. I saw the commandment from one set of grand, uh, grandparents saying I'm not to have cookies without, without permission. And the other one, I had liberty. So I, I look at that as the, as the commandment is what showed us what we could and could not do. And when it showed us we couldn't have cookies, then we wanted cookies all the more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's all I got for that That's one. That's the truth. That's the truth. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me go. Oh, I'll read it in the Amplify. We don't want to. I don't want to have to be reprimanded again by Brother Cripps. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to what now? <laughs> Nothing. I mean, <laughs> no, no, say it again. Reprimanded. Oh, reprimanded. No, I'm not going to reprimand you. Okay. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Uh, the sand engagement. Okay. Wait. By the way, a diet is a good example because the minute I tell myself I'm on a diet, I want to eat everything. Yeah, that's why okay. I call my program a okay. lifestyle change. Yeah. All right. Verse 8 in the, in the Amplified says, but sin. Finding an opportunity through the commandment to express itself produced in me every kind of coveting and selfish desire. For without the law, sin is dead. The recognition of sin is inactive. Yeah, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, nine in the uh, KJV. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived. And I died. Mm. Whoa. Wow. Okay. Brother Cripsch, you got something to say about that? Uh, sure. So I was alive. Now, I wonder when he was alive without the law, before he knew what the law was. Is he is he going back to his childhood? Or is, it, or is he saying uh, in our existence as humans, before there was a law, uh, we were alive? And well, then I'll, read it, I'll read it in the Amplified for you now. Maybe okay. it will help us. Uh, he says, I was once alive without knowledge of the law. There you go. But when the commandment came and I understood its meaning, sin became alive and I died since the law sentenced me to death. It was before when he was a child and hadn't yep. been taught the law yet. That's there you go. So he's yeah. he's doing what he does a lot of times. He, he's, he's doubling up on the point. 
Mm -hmm. So before we knew what the law was, before the commandment was known to us, we were alive. We we didn't know what sin was. We you know pretty much had liberty in our own minds. But then when someone came along and said, hey, this is wrong, that's wrong, um, once the commandment came, uh, sin revived, and I died. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Renee, anything to say about that verse? I kind of wish we could put 9 and 10 together so they make yeah. it. Okay, I'll do that. It says uh, 9 and 10. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Renee. Okay. So uh, this is interesting because he's saying that someday he, he didn't even realize he was free and happy. And then he realized he fell short. The law made him guilty. Right. And what's interesting in uh, 10, he says, and the commandment, which was ordained to life, meaning it was supposed to help us live better. It was supposed to protect us from hurting each other and hurting God. But instead, instead of it bringing life to me, like it's supposed to, if I didn't have this weakness in my flesh that couldn't keep it properly, Ooh. said the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death mm. because we are in a fallen state. We cannot keep God's standard of perfection. But the law, if we could keep it, is ordained to life. Because when you don't commit adultery, then people don't, your husband doesn't, your husband doesn't, jealous husband doesn't come kill you. When you don't steal, that guy isn't angry and cause problems. And then we got more death. But bottom, bottom line is the, the law brings death, but it was supposed to bring life. But because of the weakness of our flesh, it is death to us. And there's no way we can find life in it. Amen. Yeah. I think this verse here, it, it supports the, uh, the teaching that I've given some people about, um, especially young people. Uh, I, I'm thankful that God has finally taken away this crazy, overpowering sexual drive out of my life. Yeah, thank you, Jesus, because it really, it's like it, it can ruin your life when you obsess over something like that. And uh, then you end up doing all kinds of bad things and you forget it. You're nothing but problem, really. Uh, and, but, I, but I do understand, particularly a young man, when they're going through those feelings and, and then now they're a believer, and they were they were feeling conflicted because they have these strong overpowering feelings, and that then they, they uh, also the in their mind is I don't I don't want to do that. I know there's I shouldn't be doing that, but why? Why should they not be doing it? Well, it, because God doesn't want you to have sexual pleasure. God doesn't want you to have any fun. Wow. But God wants to spoil our party. Wow. No. It's not for that at all. God's saying, don't do this because I know what's best for you. There yes. are consequences you're not aware of. There That's what atheists think. Atheists think God just is strict and he just wants to suck all the joy out of your life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the law wasn't given there to, oh, take away your fun and, and take the joy out of life from uh, all these sexual pleasures and other things. It's because for your own good, you don't have enough sense to realize that these, these desires that we have ends up in destruction. Broken marriages, uh, uh, un, uh, uh, unplanned pregnancies, yes. born out of wedlock, uh, divorces, yes. all these consequences of these behaviors uh, are... Uh, can destroy us, and God knows that. So God tells us, "Don't do that." Not because He's trying to take away your fun and while well, your party. By right. the way, it That's not true. just destroys us personally, Luke. It destroys us as a society and our government. Because mm -hmm. when when the marriages fall apart and the kids grow up without fathers, and there's tons of unplanned pregnancies, then we start allowing laws to murder children, and then a curse comes down on a nation. Like this, this stuff builds up to, I mean, we're, we're now murdering the innocent yep. by, by the hundreds of thousands. Yep. And now it's not just the personal 
effects. It is a nation that can come under the wrath of God. Amen. Like this stuff grows bigger than we can ever imagine. Amen. And it compounds on itself decade after decade after decade. It gets it gets worse and worse and worse as we head to Christ returning. Yep. It, I, it just, it does. And that's why it's so important to keep our eyes on Jesus and um, so find our uh, And the commandment which was ordained to life, I believe that's what we're supposed to get out of this. These commandments were given so you may have life, not suffer from disease and death and all these consequences of, of, of this uh, behavior that God knows leads to problems. And we don't think about that. All we're thinking about is pleasure now. And, but God knows better. And that he gave us these to give us life. It's to, a good thing. It's for our own good that we got these laws. But as Paul goes on to say <laughs> later in this chapter, even though God tell, tells us, you know, for our own good, uh, we have this sinful nature that just makes us sin anyway. Okay. Um, let's go. Um, this next verse is the... Um, 11. Uh, verse 11, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. There he uh, goes again. Yeah. I'll read 12 also. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. See, that, that's the point that we were just talking about. If the law yep. is holy, the law is good. It's for our own good. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yep. Go ahead, brother. No, no, I was just, you know, you, you're right on top of it. Yeah. So what I was going to say was that he's making the point. Um, all the Ten Commandments, all the Ten Commandments, and it's going to be hard for some people to wrap their mind around it, but they, they're for our good. They are to protect us. And uh, Brother Luke, you mentioned a couple of things. You know, if we were, if we were following the laws of God, we could avoid uh, divorces, we could avoid abortions, we could avoid un unplanned pregnancies, we could avoid sexually transmitted diseases, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on. These laws aren't just uh, arbitrary things that God just wants to ruin our fun, as Brother Luke was saying. They're for our own good. They are. Don't kill. That's a good idea. Let's not kill because it causes all kinds of other problems. Um, being thrown in jail or being executed, just uh, two among among them, being the chief ones. Um, but they are for our own good. He loves us. The Bible is not, as the atheists think, just a rule book of do's and don'ts. It is a love letter from God to us, in which he showed us how much he loved us, that even after we sinned, he sent his son into the world to save us all from the law of sin and death and brought us unto life, the newness of, of life in Christ Jesus, as we talked about last week. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Sister Renee, verses 11 and 12. She was typing something. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sick right now. I can't even think. Hold on one second. No, you're all right. You were just in the middle of typing something. You didn't get you that. Talk, do you want to talk about verse 11 and 12? Yes. Okay. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment again. Yeah, doubling down. Me. See, when he saw the commandment, he said, I can do that. <laughs> yeah. I can do that. It deceived me. Yeah. I, I, can handle that. I can handle that. All this we will do. Yeah. Isn't that what Israel said? Yep. We can do it all. Yeah, they did say that. Yep. All this we can do. <laughs> the sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Slowly. Yeah, I can do that. And now because I said I can do that, I find that I can't do that and I'm dead. Mm. Wherefore, the law is holy. God's commandments are perfect, just, and holy. The problem is it can't make you like that. It just Ooh. make you how it shows you how you're not perfect, yep. just, and holy. Shut your mouth. Commandment holy and just and good. God's law is just, holy, and good. And it's a mirror that shows you how you're not holy, just, and good. That's all it is. Amen. Yeah. Okay, here it is in the Amplify, verse uh, um, 11 and 12. For sin, seizing its opportunity through the commandment, beguiled and completely deceived me, and using it as a weapon, killed me, separating me from God, 
So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Yeah, he uh, doesn't sound like Paul's uh, preaching against the law uh, he, as long as we understand its use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'll go to the next verse in the KJV. Love, love yeah. the word beguile, by the way. That's the only thing I want to say. Beguile yeah. is such a great descriptive word. Yeah. Okay, 13 in the KJV says, Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that is, that it might appear sin, worketh death in me, that by that which is good, that sin, by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. Brother Cripps? Um, hmm. Was then that which was good made death unto me? It's a question again at the beginning um and then there there again he's getting riled up i think that's the way i choose to to see him god forbid but sin that it might appear sin this is a little confusing to me the way he's wording it but sin that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good um works death in me again i think he's still on the same point of of us when we learn the commandment and we see that we can't do it. It's it's working death in me. You're you're being made aware that you're incapable of doing it by yourself. That's at least the way I see it. Let me, let me read it in the amplified form. Yeah, there you go. Maybe it'll help us. It says, "Did that which is good, that is the law, then become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, in order that it might be revealed as sin, oh. was producing death in me by using this good thing as a weapon." So mm. that the commandment, sin, would become exceedingly sinful. Mm. Wow. That's very clear, isn't it, Brother Chris? Yeah, that's very clear. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Right. Uh, Renee? Yeah, that, that was good. Um, it says, what was then that which is good made death unto me? So are God's laws, which are good, just, and holy, did that kill him? No. No. The fact that he can't keep them. There you go. Yep. So it's not that God's law is death. It's that God's law in our flesh is death. Ah. The flesh is incapable of doing that which is holy, just, and good. So mm. when that good thing was given to him as something he was responsible for doing, mm -mm. all it did was stir up sin, amplify how much he fails at keeping it so that he can see just how sinful he actually is. That law was a mirror to show his sin as exceedingly sinful. Was that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good. So that which is good is working death in him because he fails to keep it. And then that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly simple. So we can see his behavior next to the holy, perfect standard of God's law shows you just how much he does sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah we, we can try to dramatize it and, and, you know, try to make the point as uh, various ways, but I'll, I'll read it again in the Amplified because I'm after I read it again, it, it, it's so powerfully stated that in the Amplified. Yeah, he says, "Did that which is good, that is the law, then become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, in order that it might be revealed as sin, was producing death in me by using this good thing as a weapon, so that through the commandment." Sin would become exceedingly sinful. I, I, I can't expound on that anymore. I, mean, I, I don't know how to make it any more clear. That's just perfectly stated. So it's clear to me. Uh, hopefully, the uh, uh, the people who still think that the law is there for us to follow it as a means of earning our salvation, hopefully they'll they'll begin to see the light and realize that that, that Paul's telling us what the law is for, how we should view the law. 
Well, Jesus, I mean, it, Jesus showed them the true standards of the law. Yeah. And it's even in your mind. It's even in the intent. Yes. And, and, and the flesh, it doesn't matter if you're doing works of the law, you're not fulfilling the law. Because fulfilling the law is to be pure in heart and mind and because your mind is part of the flesh and they miss it they think if they perform it even if they think it if they just perform it they're fulfilling the law but jesus fulfilled the law because he was pure here in the mind and in deed. Mm, love it well uh paul Go ahead, Brother Chris. Uh, no, my fault. I apologize, Brother Luke, please. Paul uh, and Jesus are the two. I can't think of anybody else offhand. Maybe someone else did it. But Paul and Jesus are the, the ones that are really teaching us the point of the law. You can, you can see Paul explaining it in this way. And he, he also says another famous line of Paul's, the law is a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ to show us our need for Christ. Um, so Paul explains that in his way. Jesus also explains the purpose of the law and the severity, the, the degree of difficulty of the law so that his apostles finally throw up their hand and surrender as we were talking about earlier. Said, I can't do it, it's impossible. He, they say, if, if this is the case, how is it possible for anyone to get saved, Lord? And Jesus says, ha ha. Now you finally got it. It is impossible. With man, it is impossible. But with God, it's possible. So uh, um, both Paul and Jesus are making the same point, showing us to, and Jesus ratchets down the law, as Renee says. He, he says, you know, it's not just committing adultery with your body. It's even having a thought, a lustful thought. He was giving them no wiggle room, no way out of it to make it exceedingly sinful. Just like mm. Paul says, it becomes exceedingly sinful. Would you really mm -hmm. understand it to, to bring us to Christ? There was something else I was going to say, but I, the brain is like I, <laughs> I, weird. My brain's really weird tonight. It's supposed to be a sponge, but maybe somebody wrung it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very true. They're trying to ring it out, and they are. <laughs> okay, let's go back to the KJV uh, verse. Um, okay, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Wow, I'm going to stop there because, because. Have you ever heard someone like maybe Paul Washer uh -huh. and other lordshippers say that there's no such thing as a carnal Christian? Wow. Paul is a Christian as he's writing this letter. Yes. And Paul wasn't saved. saved. Paul Washer says St. Paul was not saved. <laughs> yeah. Paul is saying, even as he's a Christian, he says, present tense, I am carnal. Wow. You know that he wrote to the Corinthians and said they're babes in Christ and they're carnal. So they're Christian, baby Christians, and yet the whole church is carnal. Yeah. So how could anybody argue that there's no such thing as a carnal Christian when Paul says, I am carnal, sold under sin? Yeah. Okay. Brother Cripps? Yeah. So uh, my first question is, did Paul Washer say that or are you just having fun? Did he did he try to say that Paul? No, wasn't no, no. I said it because he said there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. Yeah. yeah. So Paul, we Washer said, Paul Washer said there's and preached clearly and taught, oh, exp, uh, expounded on this, that there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. If you're a Christian, you're not carnal. You can't be. So I want to make this point very, very clear because it could easily be twisted. And and Renee, if I if I say anything that needs to be um, uh, to to be paraphrased in a different way, so that I'm uh, it's clear what I'm saying, uh, please feel free to do that. But um, while we are still walking around in these flesh suits, before we have our eternal bodies and we're no longer connected to the dead flesh anymore at all, then uh, we are carnal. Amen. While we while we walk in this realm, 
we have to every day choose to walk in the spirit instead of to walk in that dead flesh. We have that choice to make. Yep. And, and we get there by the by the transformation of the daily renewing of our minds. Every day coming to him. Every day putting on the armor of God. Yep. Every day um, uh, defending against the wiles of the devil and the fiery darts. Because uh, there will be attacks. So we know that a person, even a Christian, if, if they're not choosing that day to walk in the spirit, could easily walk in the flesh. It does not mean that they're not saved. It means that they're making poor choices for that day. Just like you say to a child, um, you don't condemn them for something wrong they do and say you're bad. You say your choice was bad. You, you make a differentiation between what is a choice and what is the being of being carnal. While we have these flesh suits, uh, that's the way that it is. And Paul makes it clear here. But I am carnal, sold under sin. He was born into sin. We're all born in we're all born into that dead flesh. And we're all subject to it until we have that quickening of our spirit made alive unto Christ Jesus and we walk in the newness of life. Mm -hmm. That's Amen. perfect. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Sister Renee. <laughs> Elvis is in the house. Yes, I sure am, baby. Uh so for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. I, I love that. See, the law is perfect, just, and holy. It's uh, the spiritual standard. But it says that the law is weak in the flesh. So the law in its concept is that that's God's standard. That That's perfect. You know, that's how man should be is created to live and that and that's that's the whole that was his will but because we fell we are weak the law is now weak through the flesh so through our flesh we could not fulfill the law jesus did that's why god's god's justice is served his wrath is quenched he fulfilled the law he said not a jot or tittle would be removed till he fulfilled it he did fulfill it and then people take that as if he hadn't fulfilled it. See, not one dot or two will be removed from the law. Uh, he did fulfill it. They're acting like it's still going. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the law is still going because he said, not one dot or two will be removed till he fulfill it. Well, he did in his first. So it is removed. Okay, it tells you that. He took away the first so he can establish the second. So that did happen. Mm -hmm. So you got to catch up. Catch up. So, that's right. That's what the big tomato said to the little tomato. I know, yeah. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> it like, no, the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal. Obviously, it's just saying that uh, the law is good, but because I'm in the flesh, I'm sold under <laughs> sin. That's it. Sold under sin. Yep. It, it's impossible. Not possible for us. Uh, Hendrix uh, asked, uh, because there may be uh, either new people who don't understand all this, some of the words that we use regularly and that like carnal, what does it mean to be carnal? So let me take a minute. Uh, it's worth it. Car carnal um, really is, is, comes from the root word of, of being uh, your flesh, carny. Like if you had chili con carne, chili with meat, uh, carnival. Have you ever gone to carnival in, uh, Brazil, or they have this giant, it's like, um, it's a very lustful, uh, um, sensual, sexual, big parade and party, it's all about the flesh. Now, so carnal just means your flesh, yep. and, and flesh in the Bible can be traced back to the fall of man in the garden, in that when, when Adam and Eve rebelled against God, decided to eat from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, the Bible says that they died that day. Well, they lived about 800, 900 years physically. So how did they die that day? Uh, they died spiritually. Their spirit died. The spirit of God withdrew and they're left with a dead spirit. So since Adam and Eve, we've all inherited this condition. I was born with a physical body, uh, with a mind or soul, but a dead spirit. When I put my faith in Jesus and received uh, the gift of eternal life uh, in December of 1986, 
the Holy Spirit of God came into me, baptized me, united with my spirit, quickened my spirit, brought my spirit alive. I'm connected to the spirit of God now. Christ is in me. I am in Christ. So this is uh, now, so we, I, I, I have a spirit of God in me. I'm a spiritual being. I'm born again from above spiritually, but I'm still stuck in this body. And the body is called the body of flesh. Within the flesh, we've inherited from Adam and Eve a genetic defect. Oh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's like it's passed down from everybody. Nobody. That's has good. That's mm. good. Gosh, and, I love that. So it's just passed down through the flesh, through the re reproduction process. Everybody who's born is born with this defect, and it is called sin nature. We sin naturally. Did anybody ever teach you how to sin? How, uh, and so at the age of three, did they say, hey, uh, it's time for you to start lying. I'm going to teach you how to lie. No, nobody has to teach us how to lie. Or no. and we, I remember when I was a kid about, oh, man, maybe 12 years old. I'm in a 7-Eleven. I steal a candy bar. And I have all this drama and this excitement of stealing and something. And, and of course, I don't remember when I started lying. But uh, the point is, we the most natural thing to a person is to sin. That's our sin nature. That's the natural state of all people. And that sin is called in our flesh. So that's what it means to be carnal. Being carnal means we're living our life uh, through that the sin nature. Yeah. Okay. So that's what carnal is. So when it says that Paul is carnal, as we go on through this chapter, you'll see that Paul's confessing to us that he who many, including myself, considered to be the greatest apostle. And yet he admits that he is a carnal Christian, that he's a slave to sin. In your face, Paul Washer. Right, yeah. Brother Luke, I just wanted to remind people that the last Adam or the second Adam, Jesus, born of a virgin, did not have that genetic defect. That's yep. why he's the son of God and fulfilled the law. He was sinless. He did not have the... Adam's sin nature passed down because God was his father. Amen. 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 Now he still had to, he is still experienced what we experienced by having to wear the flesh suit so he could feel tired, so he could feel sick. So yep. Feel yep. 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 Sure did. Uh, okay. Let me read that. Uh, see how the Amplified states it. Uh, I, for those of you in the chat room that say that you're, you only, have the use the KJV. That's good. Praise Jesus. Uh, I only use the KJV first. <laughs> then I look for something else to compare it to. Uh, okay. Um, so he says, um, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a creature of the flesh. That is worldly, self-reliant, carnal, and unspiritual sold into slavery to sin and serving under its control. That's kind of what we, how we were elaborating on it the same, same way. Yeah. And, uh, and this is the apostle Paul. Uh, and, and as we go on, uh, anybody who, who dares to, to represent that they have stopped sinning after they got saved, how dare you? Uh, really the, the nerve to think that we have, I, I've said it before, but Paul, if he's not the greatest apostle, no one's greater as an apostle than Paul. And what he endured for the Lord, what he contributed to the scriptures and to the church is unsurpassed. And, and, and yet this person is confessing in this chapter that he, even at this point in his life, he still has the sin nature and he's a slave to sin. So are you greater than the apostle Paul? Me? No. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> okay. No. no. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go. To the next verse is... Um, um, this is the good one here, Brother Luke. Yeah. Okay, verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that... Do I? If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law 
that it is good. I'm going to stop there, just 15 and 16. Uh, yeah, just read the Amplified. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll read the Amplified. Renee probably doesn't need it, but uh, for... Well, I understand it, but it 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 can be it can be yeah. confusing if you yeah. haven't. We can, we can do it without the amplifier, but let's see how they phrase it. it. Says, "For I do not understand my own actions; I am baffled and bewildered by them. Mm. I do not practice what I want to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate, and yeah. yielding to my human nature, my worldliness, my sinful capacity." Now. If I habitually do what I do not want to do, that means I agree with the law, confessing that it is good, morally excellent. Love it. So I have an example that, that, that should be able to illustrate this. In my past, uh, and I know a lot of people aren't going to be able to believe this, but in my past, um, even when I, uh, was definitely saved. And even though most days I would, would, uh, say that I, um, walk in the spirit mainly, um, in a road rage situation in a rage, uh, in a, in a place where you're driving around morons, other morons in traffic that don't know what they're doing and they refuse to yield the right of way and not use their signal and go 30 miles an hour in a 55, et cetera, just for examples, I would find myself. Uh, yelling in my car at these at these strangers guilty and being upset with them and it's something i have no control over and then immediately immediately after i do that and i realize that my heart rate is up and i'm in this place where i'm like oh you you know just clenched fists and all that i'm immediately convicted and i realize that i just let myself walk in the flesh I just did something that I know I do not want to do. I just did it. It just happened. And, I, and I, it, I'm ashamed of that. I'm ashamed that I ever do that. I always want to be loving. I always want to consider that the morons out there driving, I don't know what their day was like. I have no idea what they're going through. It doesn't, it doesn't make it right that they don't know how to drive or they don't follow the laws of the, uh, on the road. But I am responsible for my actions. I'm responsible for my reactions. So uh, for me, for someone that wants to walk in the newness of life, when it's pointed out to me easily by the Holy Spirit that I am very capable, no matter how good I did the rest of the day, that I'm capable of being in that place where Paul's talking about here. Uh, you know, what, I, what, I, what he wants to do, he doesn't do. He does the opposite sometimes. And that's because of that carnal we, that we pointed out in the verse above. Because we're we're constantly struggling in this flesh suit that we live in against the dead uh, the dead uh, flesh, and we're um, we're asked by God to walk in newness of life, and that's what we want to do. Mm -hmm. Amen, Sister Renee. Uh, I am guilty of that. That is a perfect example of you want to do right, but your flesh is fighting against, and you do it, and then you oh, I hate that I just did that. Um, yep. I wanted to say, I just want to read it. All right. For that which I do, I allow not. So I'm doing stuff that I don't even want to do. And for what I would, that I do not. So the stuff I want to do, I'm not doing. But what I hate, that I do. Even the stuff he despises, he does not want to do it, he's still doing it. He's just saying, I don't even allow, I never plan to do these things. Uh, what I want to do, I'm not capable of doing. And even the thing that I hate, I'm still doing it. But if then I do that, which I would not. So if I'm doing stuff that I have no desire to do, that I know is wrong, I don't want to do it, I can send him to the law that it is good. You just got capable of doing it. Mm -hmm. I had a, 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 a former friend of mine that I would always argue on this portion of scriptures that Paul is talking about his life prior to being a Christian. Oh my gosh, I hate it when they do that. They're making that up. There's nowhere in there that says this was what I used to do. The no. law still kills. The law still kills. It never stops killing. Yeah. That, that's a well, lie. Yeah. I, I, what the, the effort you have to go to to deny the present tense in all of these verses is just, it, you, it's, you have to just, 
what is it called when you're you just refuse to accept something in your own mind cognitive dissonance or something i don't know maybe i'm misusing yeah, that. cognitive dissonance that's yeah. correct yeah thank you uh okay let me read it um now the go on it oh by the way um it's late uh, yeah. where you are and t you guys stop me when you're ready to stop because if, if we if you we don't have to get through this whole chapter but it is one of the best chapters we want to talk about but stop me we can always continue with the rest of it next time okay um, well it's up to what renee wants to do but i don't um it, it's 11 o'clock here so i don't want to go too late but it, i'm i'm open to what everyone else wants to do just yeah, I, I mean i i'm fine i could go a little bit i was a little bit late okay. but uh well, I, we, I did well, yeah huh? I did want to answer this lady. She's asking, what does it mean, carnal, like a carnal Christian? Carnal that Luke was talking about, this is for I glitter. <laughs> carnal that Luke was talking about is just simply being alive in our fallen flesh. Uh, and, and Brother Jason was talking about that too. You know, as long as we're in these flesh suits, he said, I think. That was great. Yep. Yep. Uh, and then Brother Luke also said, we're born with a genetic defect. That's being carnal. That's being in the flesh. Your flesh has desires. Now, if you're talking about a carnal Christian, do you want to know what's the difference between an unsaved person and a carnal Christian? An unsaved person is not carnal. They're dead. An unsaved person is dead. They're zombies. They're, they're not carnal. They, they're they just a walking dead because when they die, yep. it's the second death. There's no life in them. The yep. spirit is life. Without the Holy Spirit, there's no life. Uh, so... Uh, a carnal Christian is a person that is alive in Christ, but is choosing to follow the flesh's desires more than the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That's what it means by Holy Spirit, like a carnal Christian. It'd be someone that's living like the world, like like they weren't even saved. You wouldn't even know they were saved by how they live. And that's what it means by a carnal Christian. And they do exist, and I believe they're babes in Christ. They just never grew. They never do. Mm -hmm. that, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, stop me with when we when it's too late for you. Okay. Uh, uh, now, verse seventeen. So don't think that Paul is, is um, you know going to leave it right there. That would be pretty bad if, if he didn't say any more. <laughs> you know. So Here verse goes. seventeen. Uh, it's important that you get this part. He says, "Now then." It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Sister Renee, you want to go first this time, 17 and 18? Yeah, I, I do, but I also want to address this. She said something like, well, that's they look the same, and that's just an excuse for somebody to excuse sin. No, there none of us here are excusing carnality or no. not living for God, but you can't deny it exists just because you don't like it. Well, wait a second. Is she, is she denying, is she denying that the apostle Paul is the one teaching this? No, she, she, when I tried to explain that a, there is a carnal Christian, there's Christian, I may be mistaking her. If I'm misunderstanding your comment, I'm sorry, but it looked like uh, she believed that that was just excusing sin. No, there are Christians that get saved that just never grow and then they live like the world. And we can't just say they don't exist and they're not saved. But we're not, we're not excusing it, we're not saying it. Carnal you're, is just also in the flesh, period, right? Yeah, you're you're def, you're defending yourself just the way the apostle Paul is defending himself. The reason he's writing all this is because he's being accused, just like this person is saying. Isn't that just an excuse to go on sinning? That's right. what the apostle Paul's addressing here. He's being accused. Oh, Paul's just false teacher. He's just telling people, no big deal. Go ahead and sin. It's just an excuse to go on sinning. And this is Paul's defense of it. That we all do this. We, we all do that. Have Even the Apostle Paul. Paul. Right. And it's inescapable because we're still living in the flesh. Right. We we all, in the flesh. Some might some might do a little bit better than others, 
but we're still all fallen. The law makes us all guilty and sin is sin. So it's not a matter of, well, that person's living in more sin and I'm better. No, we're all, we all struggle as long as we're in this flesh. Yep. Always. It doesn't what? mean we say, well, we're going to sin anyway, so I might as well go kill somebody. That's not it at all. Is that we're going to fight the good fight. We're yeah. going to, we're going to listen to the spirit. We're going to walk in newness of life, but we will fail. It's, as long as we're in this flesh, we will never keep God's law. We will never be able to keep the standard of his perfection. No one is saying don't do what's right because you're in the flesh anyway. Yeah. But so, what you've done is, is uh, they're, they've put you in the same position that the apostle Paul found himself and that's why he's writing this portion of scriptures, because people are saying the same thing to him back then that he just got said to you or us. And, 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 and he, this is Paul's defense. So don't listen to us. Just listen to these scriptures. The Apostle Paul has given you your answer. Uh, Brother Cripps. Yeah. The first thing I want to say is uh, when uh, Renee was talking about all, all, all. So all, all means all. That's all, all means. It, it means all. I, uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't yeah. mean some. It doesn't mean a few. It means all. And I think she she's on our side because she. You said, know she is. She cleared it up. Yeah, yeah. She said, "What's the difference between a carnal Christian and a carnal Christian? Nothing." Because Paul said he's the chief of sinners. You're absolutely right, sister. Yeah. Uh, he's admitting he himself is, and if he's the chief of sinners and he's saved, then he the Lord can save. Yeah. Absolutely, I understand your point. Yeah. Uh, I also, but, like. That well, that was said because it needed to be addressed. Yeah, but what, what we're doing, uh, all of our channels, our our ministries are all based upon preaching this gospel, and and we're accused every day of the same thing that they were charging against Paul. Yeah, and and Paul keeps on bringing up their arguments, saying, "God forbid, that's not what we're saying at all," and we right. find ourselves today almost 2,000 years later, in the exact same position Paul was in, saying, God forbid, we're not saying that at all. Listen. Listen to Paul's answer, because uh, our answer is the same as Paul's. Amen. So uh, he says, uh, Brother Cripps, did you go yet or not? I did not, no. I was in the middle of it, but that's okay. We were clearing up something in the chat room and stuff. So um, I, it won't take me very long. So verse 17 um, so what he's saying that it's the it, it's sin that dwelleth in him. Again, it's referring to that the, the flesh suits that we walk around in and the aspect of us that used to be dead when we have that that dead spirit quickened and made alive into the newness of Christ Jesus, then again, it's that choice that we make every day. And and, and this is where it gets twisted. You know, people, people think, oh, we have to walk in holiness and think that we're possible in doing that. No, we're not possible. It's not possible to do that. Now, Christ in us can do it. Absolutely. But we have to make that choice every day what to do. So it's the sin that Paul is saying, it's the sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is my flesh, that's the point he's making, dwelleth no good thing. So in other words, when we're the zombie, there's no good thing in us. When we're walking as walking dead, we have no good. We're not capable of doing good. We're not capable of producing good fruit. For the will is present in me. Okay, that's the will. That's the same idea um, of in the garden when uh, Jesus wanted them to pray with him and he came back and they were sleeping. He said, can you not stay awake? And then he goes away and prays again and asks them to pray with him. He comes back, they're asleep again. And what did he say? The, the spirit, uh, is, willing. spirit yeah. is willing. The flesh is weak. That's, that's it. Uh, so that's the point. Uh, dwelleth no good thing to will is present in me. He does have that will, but how to perform that, which is good. I find not. He's not able to find it. Now, when we walk in the newness of life and when we walk constantly in the spirit, we do learn. We, we go from being babes in Christ to, to uh, growing up in the experience of that. And it gets easier and easier and easier. But it's still going to be a struggle. It's a struggle for the person that's been been uh, saved and walking in that for 69 years, just as the one's been walking for six months. I mean, it, yeah, some things get easier. It's, you know, it's easier the more we walk in it, the easier it is uh, in a lot of cases, but it's still a constant struggle. We'll struggle with that until he frees us from the flesh suits. Brother, I'm sorry, Jason. Go ahead. No, I'm done. I, I just wanted to 
because I actually didn't get to the scripture. I wanted to put one thing out. Hmm. Now then it is no more I that do it. Yeah. But sin dwelleth in me. He's separating who he is as an identity from his flesh. Amen. Because yeah. that new spirit, that new man that he is, he's not doing that. It's the flesh, the sin that dwells in his flesh. Because he tells you there, he said, I know that in me and my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present. I want to do it, but how to do it, I can't. I don't, I can't find how. And so I, I like that he separates that him is the new man, the new reborn spirit, that new man. One day we'll have a glorified body that doesn't struggle anymore against this flesh, the thing that has no good in it. But it's not him. Is that God doesn't see that it's Paul sinning. Paul saved, secure, righteousness of God. It's the failure of his flesh. And so I like that he's separating that because it's not his desire to do these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say in my amateur psychiatric career that every Christian is a schizophrenic. Oh, yes. We yes. have a conflict between two identities. Yes. And that's what Paul is going on in the next few verses. He's explaining this schizophrenia he has and that we all have. If we have our bodies and if we have the Holy Spirit, we are schizophrenic. And there's a struggle between the two identities. This is mm. not past tense either. For those people that said that to you, Luke. Oh, this was him before he got. No, it didn't say I was. I did have this problem. Oh, wretched man that I used to be. He's mm -hmm. saying right now, I am, I have, it's me now, now, now. Yeah. How do they make that a past tense situation? It's written in the present. Now, Paul, you know, he goes on to tell us that the, the uh, uh, in this chapter and, and more right of his writings, he goes on to tell us that, that we can grow spiritually and we can, we become more of the spirit and less of the flesh. Okay. And as we mature, uh, then this this uh, spirit will become the predominant personality in the schizophrenia. But we're never going to get rid of this other character here until we get rid of this body and get a glorified body. So you'll always have a struggle going on, even though some of us are growing and getting more success. But my question is, again, here we have maybe the greatest apostle in the Bible and don't you think he has been wanting to walk in the spirit all the time? Yeah. I mean, he, he understands walking in the spirit, walking in the flesh, but he's saying even he, if he can't do, walk in the spirit all the time, how do you think that you're going to be able to do it when Paul couldn't? Okay, let me read this in the Amplified and see how it states it. He says, uh, now, if I habitually do what I do not want to do, that means I agree with the law, confessing that it is good, morally excellent. So now, if that is the case, then it is no longer I who do it, the disobedient thing which I despise, but the sin nature which lives in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my flesh, my human nature, my worldliness, my sinful capacity. For the willingness to do good is present in me, but the doing of good is not. Amen. I always say, I've been saying this for many, many years to all those people that are who uh, are holier than thou. <laughs> you know, this is, you know, I have got a comment on a video today, the five top five reasons people reject Christianity. And someone made a comment on that one. And that's an old video. I have another video of the, 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 uh, uh, the, the top reasons Christians make me sick. Now, oh, Brother Luke, that's a horrible thing to say. I'm going to unsub you. Go ahead. But uh, the, the, the hypocrisy of many Christians, is, people say, I've heard them say, I don't want anything to do with it. The Christians are hypocrites. Yeah. And it's true. Uh, many hypocrites are clearly very hypocritical. And probably all of us have some degree of hypocrisy. But I'll tell you what, Jesus is not a hypocrite. Your faith is in Jesus. You're relying on him. So our hypocrisy, don't let that prevent you from embracing Jesus and his gift of eternal life.
That's right. Uh, uh, but my point is that the um, the people who uh, are holier than thou and full of self-righteousness and act like they're above all this, uh, it just boggles my mind. The denial, the state of denial. There, there's another psych psychiatric word I'm going to use on you. You're schizophrenic, but you're in denial. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, I'll go a little further here. Uh, uh, 19. Verse 21, I'm on, right? Yeah. Mm. I think. I just did, yeah. For, oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, I'll read to start with 19. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Mm. Verse 20. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members for the Crips. Yeah. He's getting down to it here again. This is, yeah. he's doubling up on these same yeah, things. Verse 23, go ahead. Uh, 23, but I see another law in my members. Okay. There's that, that, uh, that word again, the members. So the, um, as we, as we discussed, uh, that, that means our parts, simply our parts warring against the law of my mind. The mind is where the battlefield takes place. Honestly. I mean, that's where, um, you have a have an errant thought or sinful thought come in, and you have a choice what to do with it. Um, you know, uh, and God does always provide a way out when when we're tempted. He provides a way out. We don't have to seize on that thought and turn it into something. We don't have to act on it. But that's where the the walking in the newness of life uh, in Jesus Christ comes into play. Where we, uh, again, it's that choice that I keep talking about of walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit. Um, so we can choose in that moment to have an, uh, a thought come into our head and not to dwell on it, not to make it into a sin. Uh, thoughts come in our head all the time. Is a thought necessarily a thought in and of itself a sin? I mean, if, if you were to say yes, then I, you know I, I don't know where to go from there. Uh, because we think things all the time and uh, because we're still walking around in, in these flesh suits and we still have um, that dead flesh to contend with, um, it's a constant challenge. So it's a warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity. That's what it wants to do. The flesh wants to drag you back into being a zombie again. It can't, but it wants to try. <laughs> it sure wants to try uh, the captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So he's doubling down on this idea that we're walking in this all, all the time, that that um, that this is the, this is the state we're in, that we uh, what we want to do we don't do, what we don't want to do we do, and that's because of that that uh, that flesh, that war inside us that happens in our mind. That's that's the battlefield. Yeah. Well, uh, my schizophrenic sister Renee, uh, you're not in denial. <laughs> you're not in denial, are you? Nope. Verse 21, 2, and 3, please. What did he say? The Nile in a river in Egypt or something. Yeah, um, yeah the, the, the Nile is not just a river in Egypt. <laughs> uh, Jason, thank you for reminding us it's a choice because I'm so sick of these lordship pastors saying, if you're really saved, you won't desire these things anymore. If oh you're really God. saved, you will want what God wants and love what he wants and do what the... Okay. Mm. Uh, no, because your flesh still wants what it wants. Yeah. That's why Paul says, put on the new man. Yes. Why would he tell you that? Because you still got the old man you got to contend with. And this chapter is great for showing that battle. And I'm so glad because he divides our true identity from this thing we got to fight all the time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we lose that battle. But if we just keep going and renewing our minds little by little, we'll get better. No, you can't say, oh, I haven't sinned. I heard somebody, I haven't sinned in 40 years. What a nut job. That guy <laughs> yeah. in denial. Oh. So, you know, I, I'm so glad that this is showing that. 
I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me again. He wants to do it, but the evil in the flesh is still there. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's the new man. Mm. But I see another law in my members. That's my body, my hands, my my eyes, you know, mm. wanting things, my hands wanting to do things they shouldn't be yeah. doing. Feet quick to mischief, mouth yeah. backbiting and stirring up division, mm. warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And by the way, it, it, if you do try to bring in the Mosaic law, it will put you in bondage and you will be right back into that captivity Amen. The law of sin in your flesh. You have got to remain in God's grace, renew your mind daily, remind you. Somebody said, doesn't the Holy Spirit convict us of sin? No, the accuser of the brethren is constantly accusing you of your sin. The whole, you're mixing up the voice of the devil with the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is called the comforter, not the accuser. And he convicts the world of sin because they don't believe. He convicts the believer of their right standing in God. And he will remind you of your identity. Hey, that's not who, that's not who you are. Yep. You're not a thief. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. Hey, that's not what you who you are. You don't commit adultery. Don't you know doing that is is you're joining the Lord to the harlot. That's not who you are. It's mm. not accusing. It's comforting you and reminding you of your identity. It's a whole different voice. And it's crazy because he convicts you of sin. No, he's convicting. He's keeping your eyes. He's always going to point you back to Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Not the law. Right. He's going to point you to Jesus. And people are mixing. I believe they're mixing up the voice of the Holy Spirit with the voice of the accuser or the voice of the flesh. Or the voice of law. That's Thank what I think we're mixing up. Thank you, Renee. Thanks for pointing that out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. The idea, the idea of the members, and th this is the parts of, of, the, of your body, right? G Jesus says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. So this is an example of a member or hand. You know, this the hand, maybe that's what takes and steals the object. Or the hand is what touches the beginnings of the lust in your mind. Now you're putting your hands into into play, uh, or and the various other parts of our, our body that are members that parts of our bodies as following our thoughts into sin. <clears throat> but let me read this portion in the Amplified. And we're almost finished now. Verse twenty one, two and three in the Amplified says, "So I find it." to be the law of my inner self that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully delight in the law of God in my inner self with my new nature. But I see a different law and rule of action in the members of my body in its appetites and desires. Waging war against the law, the law of my mind and subduing me and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is within my members. Mm. That's 21, two and three. Yeah. So let me read 24 and 25 in the KJV. And uh, we'll be, I can't believe we got through this chapter, but we can do it. Yeah. KJV 24 and 25. Okay. Another question. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Mm. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Renee, you want to go first on this one? If not, Brother Cripps, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wretched man that I am! Exclamation point. He's bringing this home so that everybody understands it. I and had off my thing off. I'm so sorry. <laughs> go ahead, buddy. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And I just want to point out, Hendricks uh, did that quote in the chat. Oh, wretched man that I am. Present tense equals present tense. Mm -hmm. 
That's yeah. absolutely right. Oh, wretched man that I am. Paul, even Paul, the, one of the greatest apostles uh, ever, you know, is saying about himself, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Question mark. And then he answers in, in 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. So he's saying that, that again, it's that choice of walking in the newness of life. In our minds, we can, with the help of the Holy Spirit that walks in us, by his spirit, we are able to walk in that. And he says, I myself serve the law of God. And that's what that looks like when we when we obey him, when we walk in his, his law, when we treat others with love and kindness, and when we produce the fruits that he gives us to produce. Um, that, that's how that looks. That's, that's, uh, what we pay attention to. We don't have to pay attention. As Renee said earlier, we don't have to keep looking. Did I do this today? Did I do that today? Um, all we have to do is keep our eyes on Jesus. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is the vehicle in which we arrive at this place. Without him, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to do it. We're not able to do it. Uh, but with the flesh, the law of sin, yeah, again, it's that dead zombie flesh that wants to do the things of, uh, uh, that it used to do before the spirit was quickened and made alive. And again, it's just the condition that we're in, the carnal uh, attitude, the carnal idea uh, that we're in in this realm until um, our bodies are quickened then into the newness of life, into eternity, and we're no longer saddled with the flesh shoots or the former desires of the flesh anymore. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Amen. And, uh, okay, Sister Ray, 24 and 25. Yeah, I am. I'm so sorry. I was talking and my, my microphone was off. Okay. <laughs> it says, oh, wretched man that I am. I love that he says present tense. He said, oh, wretched man I used to be before I got saved. <laughs> oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He knows that the flesh, there's nothing good in it. Nothing but sin. And he wants to be free from it because in his heart and mind, he wants to do what's right. Amen. And this constant struggle is the old man and the new man constantly battling. Like you said, we're schizophrenic, but there really is a battle. That's why Paul is constantly saying, don't you know you died with Christ? If you reckon yourself dead to sin, if you, if you put in your mind that you were on the cross with Jesus, and this flesh is already dead, you'll not listen to it. You'll say, hey, you're dead. Shut up. Let's do what the Spirit says to do, right? So the battle here is in the mind. Renew your mind daily. Know who you are. Who does God say you are? You're righteous, just, and holy. Okay, let's manifest that. Let's live in that truth and let that man take over. But he knows that until he's out of this body, that's going to be a constant battle. And it's exhausting. And it really is. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That says so much because he answers the question, who's going to deliver him from the body of this death? It's Jesus Christ. God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, will deliver us from this body of death. One day, this will be gone, and he will give us a glorified body. This corruption must put on incorruption. This mortality will put on immortality. So in the mind, I myself serve the law of God. And again, with the flesh, the law of sin. So it's just the old man, the new man. It's exhausting. He feels wretched because he, as much as he wants to do it, he can't. And one day he can look forward to the hope of being free from this body of death. That's a hope we can all have. Because God that cannot lie promised us uh, incorruption and immortality and that we will be like him and as he is so are we in this world amen i believe it amen uh, so in 24 and 25 we have a um a statement a declaration uh then a question then the answer to the question and first this declaration oh wretched man that i am Mm. Paul is confessing to everybody, to all of us now, that he's a wretched man. Yes. Now, are, are you really so deluded that you think that you're above this? 
Apostle Paul, he was really a screwed up person. He just he's just a weak Christian. Oh no, is that what you think? <laughs> I mean, if the Apostle Paul, he was whipped uh, three times with thirty nine lashes. He was beaten with rods. He was ship shipwrecked. He finally he was beheaded, and the other things I'm sure I forgot. And all that, his faith was so strong. Uh, it, it, he never he never wavered, and yet. A man of such great faith, he says, oh, wretched man that I am. Do you think you're better than the Apostle Paul? Or can you confess, oh, wretched man that you are, or woman? And then, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Who? So this body, it's a body of death because... We're, we're still destined to the, for this body to die. But thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We promised a glorified body at the resurrection. So we can celebrate in that. But this is a body that's just dying right now. I know my body is dying. I mean, I went to the doctor today and he told me some things that I didn't even know. Now, I've got a medical history like this. And I didn't even know things on that list that people didn't even tell me things I've got. Right. My body is like so sick and decrepit and, and, you know, okay, I look fairly healthy, but if you really knew, it's a body of death. I'm just waiting to die very soon, maybe a year, maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years. That's pretty darn soon. And so I've got a body of death. Who's going to rescue me from it? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus I know that once this body's dead, I won't have the sin nature tormenting me and this conflict going on. I have a glorified body without the sin nature, free from it. Yes. No more conflict. No more struggle. No more, no more schizophrenia. Right. <laughs> I'll just we will be. We will be united with the body that God has waiting for us. We'll be forever with Him and forever with each other. Oh my gosh! What a wonderful yeah. thought. All right, ver I'll read these two verses in the Amplified to see how they uh, expound on it. You heard my, how I expounded on it. Wretched and miserable man that I am, who will rescue me and set me free from this body of death, this corrupt mortal existence? Thanks be to God for my deliverance through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes. So then... On the one hand, I myself with my mind serve the law of God, but on the other hand, with my flesh, my human nature, my worldliness, my sinful capacity, I serve the law of sin. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Two identities and a conflict going on. I'll tell you that you can... You can gain uh, power over it, and you can grow and mature. But even the Apostle Paul, like you said, hey, sometimes it only takes a certain point to push me. Most of the time, I can let it roll off my back. But if someone pushes me enough, all of a sudden, my temper will flare up. It's only a question of how far, it, uh, how much we get to need to get pushed before that, that old man comes out. Yep. Uh, but as we grow and mature, the, the inner man, we walk in the spirit. Yep. But even the Apostle Paul couldn't do it all the time. He recognized that. Mm. But let me get everybody's uh, final thoughts. Uh, Brother Cripps, uh, kind of give me a little summary of our this chapter 7. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, be another beautiful study. I am so glad to be here with you guys and with the people in the chat and fellowship and everything is great in here. And I just love it. Um, so we get the point from this and he keeps pounding. I love how he keeps pounding the same points again and again and again. And as we've said, it's because um, I, I believe the Holy Spirit let Paul know that the, that Everything that he was facing back then, these same struggles would be going on in 2019. That people would still read the words that are written and still get it twisted. Because, again, we're, gosh, we're looking at Scripture and we're reading it. And we're supposed to be using the Holy Spirit as a guide to show us how to understand the words that we're reading. And if we're if we're looking at the words that we're reading and we're not coming to the we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to 
uh, translate them for us. And we're using our own understanding to try to uh, filter scripture through. Then that's where you get the, the twisted ideas. You get the misinterpretations. You get the false prophecy, you know, false prophets and whatnot. Um, it, you know, it's, it's good to uh, pray before reading and uh, ask God to uh, open your eyes and ears. And fortunately for those that walk with him, uh, it is, it, he does that for us daily. Again, I've said it several times in this, uh, this particular um, on the show. Um, it's by the, the transformation, the daily renewing of our minds, daily uh, making that choice. And um, I, I think Paul does a really good job here. I'm glad we got through the whole uh, chapter, and I, I, I can't wait till next week. Thank you. Amen. All right. Sister hey, uh, you just met. We got a guy in the chat room. Paul was speaking in past tense. If Paul wanted to speak in past tense, he'd use words like this. Let me show you in English. Was. Wretched man that I was. Uh, the things that I did not want to do, I did. Uh, the things that I hate, I used to do. Yep. He's talking about being in the flesh now. He yep. says he's not going to be free from this body of death. That is his fallen flesh. Oh, wretched man that I am. He didn't say I used to be. And he wants to be free from his body of death. That is the flesh that we all struggle against. That is the worst eisegesis on the planet to make it a past tense situation when the whole entire chapter is written in present tense. That is you trying to put something into scripture instead of taking out what was said because you were trying to prove that you don't sin anymore or that it's possible to work in sinless perfection is a lie. And it's a way that you can condemn others for their failings when you think you have overcome sins. No, but you forget sin of omission, the sin of pride. The sin, all kinds of sin you forgot you don't even know you committed. David talked about that. So he is not talking in past tense. You can't make scripture say what you want to believe. You have to take out what it actually is saying. And so it's just wrong to say it. It's wrong. It's bad scripture study to do that. Yeah. Amen. Well, this is probably the, the worst example of um, being, um, uh, what is the, what is it, the concept when someone uh, stumbles, uh, stumbles at a verse, that's a stumbling block uh, versus a stumbling block. They really, any person who, who th thinks that, this is not present tense that Paul, even at that point in his life, uh, is talking about his current state, then you're deceiving yourself. And I have to really challenge you. Do you even have the Holy Spirit in you? I mean, because you, how could you possibly uh, force that, that conclusion when every single verse we talked about tonight, there was not one time was it ever stated as a past tense and um uh, it, it's just maybe english is not your uh, your native language or something but i'm not going to give you any more time and attention uh uh okay uh that was chapter seven and uh, we'll be on moving on to chapter eight verse one uh, next week so if you're not familiar with this program uh it's every wednesday night we're working our way through the pauline epistles so we'll pick up with Romans chapter 8, verse 1, next Wednesday, uh, about 9 p.m. Eastern time. And, uh, and also, don't forget to join me in two days, uh, Friday night on the same channel, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern. I'll be doing an interview of one of the members of the congregation, uh, Sister Stacy Cook. And, uh, oh. and, and then don't forget to join us every Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern for our Church of the Eternally Secure uh, congregation service. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, I'll let you say good night, uh, Brother Cripps, and then to Renee, and then myself. Good night, guys. Appreciate everyone in the chat room. You guys are awesome. Thank you for all your support and encouragement while we do these broadcasts. Thank you for listening and paying attention and um, making comments that actually refer to what's being studied. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We love it when you guys are involved. Uh, very, very good. I love each and every one of you, and I long for the day when we can be together 
uh, with our Savior, and I get to see you guys face to face. It's really unfortunate. I mean, I'm glad we have this medium where we can come together for studies like this, but I have to tell you, my heart does yearn to, to see many of you and fellowship with you in person. And I know that we'll get a chance to do that. The cool thing is we're bonding right now in this realm so that when we get there, we'll know each other when we see each other. And it's going to be fantastic, even in our eternal bodies. Someone earlier had asked the question, wondering what our eternal bodies would look like. Well, we don't know exactly what they'll look like, but uh, Christ was the first fruits. And we know that he had lots of things. He could do lots of things that we're not able to do yet. Uh, so we look forward to that. And we know that... Um, uh, we'll be able, what God has prepared for us is beyond anything we could ever ask or think. So if you can think of it, you can dream about it, you can imagine it, go beyond that. Because it's 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 further beyond that, uh, what he has prepared for us. And I just look forward to that. Um, thank you to Brother Luke for allowing me to be part of this uh, broadcast as usual. And for Nay, as always, thank you uh, both for your uh, support and, and doing these broadcasts with me. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much, and good night, folks. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, Jason. Your brother Cripps and Renee, want to say your good night? Oh, yeah. I wanted to also thank the viewers for really staying on topic in the chat. Like, you guys were listening. You were responding, posting verses relevant to the subject at hand, and it meant that you guys were listening and uh, partaking with us, and that really means a lot. And uh, I appreciate it. I, I love this chapter, not because it justifies sin, but that it confirms that there we have two, two people. We got the old man and the new man and that uh, we should we should really listen to the spirit. Uh, oh, boy. Meow. <laughs> Jason. Meow, meow. Jason. Jason. <laughs> ah. <laughs> you got it. Gosh, I thought I was free for, for the rest of the night, but no. <laughs> All right. Let Roger go. Let Roger go to bed, Jim. Go to bed. Get your cast. Yeah, I know. It's a little late, isn't it? That we're going <laughs> to struggle against the flesh, but we do have the hope of being free. And we're one day we're going to be just like Jesus in our glorified bodies, and we hang on to that hope. And, uh, you know, the ones that came late that were being yucky, if I offended you, I am a little harsh. I do apologize. But you feel free to hate me, but please don't don't reject the gospel that Christ died for you. And it's a free gift because you don't like me, the del the person delivering it. Come on, okay. now. go to it. Go to somebody else that you like, but please, whatever you do, uh, listen to the gospel of grace. Eternal life's a free gift uh, received by grace, and Jesus paid it all for you. Mm -hmm. You know. Good night, everybody, and thanks for having me, you guys. Good night, man. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Renee and Brother Cripps, uh, for, especially for staying up uh, about forty-five minutes later than we normally finish. Uh, oh, God. Thanks for hanging in there. We got through the whole chapter. It's the kind of chapter that you'd like to bring to a conclusion instead of stop it in the, yes, in yes. the middle of it, you know. And yes. uh, to the chat room, I agree with Renee. Uh, it's amazing. Not only do we have a uh, grace and a love and charity in, in your um, talks in the chat room. Uh, but uh, you guys actually were following along with this. A lot of times we see you get off on all kinds of other tangents and discussions. So uh, it is nice when you're following along with us like that. So thank you. So, okay, join me uh, uh, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays in these programs. Mm. And uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.